Kicking off the list at number 10, Together at Last. Remember when you were a kid and your mom would bump into their friend at the grocery store? That was the worst. While they caught up for what seemed like hours, you were bored out of your mind just staring at like bags of rice and cleaning detergent. That's when the shrew's fiddle comes in. Two women would be locked together, hands included, and face each other. All because they were too loud or they were arguing. These were used in the Middle Ages, most commonly in Germany and Austria, and the contraption would have three holes, one for each wrist and the third for your neck. Now sometimes they would attach a bell to these shrew's fiddles to alert the town that the victim was walking by, you know, in order to talk smack, maybe huck a tomato or two. But the double fiddle, that was the worst. You weren't released until the argument had settled. Some families have an argument shirt where they put the two little siblings in and they can't take the shirt off until they get along. This is like a horrible medieval ages version of that. Much, much more uncomfortable. Not made of cotton. Or funny. Just bad. Just all bad. Number nine, point blank period. All right, babes, let's try not to shudder, but let's talk about periods for a second. Aunt Flo, the Red Sea, Shark Week, so many names to describe a pretty sucky time for people who get their period, right? Well, it might suck these days, but back in the medieval times, it was a hell of a lot worse. They just didn't have the same kinds of resources that we have today, so a lot of people had to use their noodle to figure out how to get by. Period products weren't really a thing back then, so people had to get creative. They would use rags or other linens to fashion a pad, but underwear also wasn't really all that popular yet, so they had to find a way to keep things in place. They would also sometimes fashion a makeshift medieval tampon of sorts where they would wrap cotton fabric around a twig and shove it up their hoo-ha. Sounds mighty uncomfortable if you ask me. Some people would also seek out bog moss because it was remarkably absorbent, so they would make their period products out of that sometimes too. This type of moss garnered the name blood moss because of its use in treating wounds and use in period products. For other people who just couldn't create these kinds of things, they would just resort to wearing red the whole time, so everything just kind of blended in. Menstruation, but make it fashion. Number eight, the ducking stool. This next one requires so much effort as like a team. I can't believe this was a real thing. The ducking stool was made to punish women involved in sexual activities. How dare you? Shame. Men were punished too, but if we know anything about history, it was mostly women who had to put up with this shit. There was first the standard ducking stool, so women would have to sit in this chair, strapped down while sitting outside of their home, or they were carried down the street. Humiliation at its finest. The town would be like, that sucks, can you believe it? Let's take the day off work and embarrass them now. Losers, they're the losers. So stupid, so backwards. The second version of the ducking stool was essentially the same thing, only it was ducked into a river over and over and over again to cool her moderate heat. At least that's what French writer Francois Maximilien Misson says. They should cool off all those angry villagers, if anything. I don't know, dip them in the river. They're the ones burning with rage because somebody who lives over there had sex once. It's really weird. Go home. Relax. At number seven, Satan's incarnate. Back in the medieval age, women were very much oppressed and incredibly misunderstood. I mean, they thought so many women were witches, and as time went on, the criteria for diagnosing a woman with witchitis or whatever got bigger and bigger to the point where literally any woman could be accused of being a witch for the most BS reasons. Back then, people thought that women were Satan's incarnate, and so they were predisposed to sin, and therefore, they had to be witches. Logic, not quite present, but go off, I guess. There were four reasons why a woman could be considered part of the devil's posse. One, because it was believed that women are foolish and gullible, which is why they turned to magic. Two, because women are insatiable when it comes to their carnal pleasures, and so they seek out help from the devil to satiate their needs. Three, because women talk a lot and we speak lies, apparently. And four, because women are weak, and the only way we can seek revenge is by using magic powers and spells. Now what in the balls is this all about? I don't know. Maybe men in medieval times were just jealous that they couldn't kiki it up with the devil, or because they knew deep down that women run the world. Number six, nosy neighbor. If you were a man back in the Middle Ages and you had an affair, well, you would have to pay a fine. And then that's it. You would go back to your life. But if you're a woman, like everything else on this insane list, it was so, so much worse. 
Affairs happen a lot, okay? It's normal. Remember that Ashley Madison scandal back in 2015? It sucks, but also it's not surprising at all. This isn't news to us. Back in the Middle Ages, women were treated the worst for these affairs. They would take their noses off. They would literally take a woman's nose and or ears off of their face because they had an affair. Frederick II used to punish adulterers by using renotomy. That was the removal of one's nose. The whole point of this was to make the victim unattractive. Isn't that the worst thing you've ever heard? This is a real thing people did, swear to God. Thing is, nobody is running around confessing that they're cheaters. Somebody has clearly spilled the beans, so they knew what was gonna happen if they got caught, yet they would still rat each other out. Meanwhile, the guy just pays a small fee. Snitches get stitches, just saying. At number five, married young. Lots of people get married at different ages. I mean, I know people I went to high school with who are already married, and I know people who didn't get married until later in life. But in medieval times, women, or rather girls, were getting married off at very young ages. At just 12 years old, a girl would reach the age of maturity and was then entitled to marry, usually to someone her parents had already chosen for her. To me, that just sounds so unfair, right? I mean, this kid hasn't really been able to live their life, make mistakes, and learn from them, and now they're expected to be a wife and soon a mother? I could never. I mean, I'm only 22, so I'm not even thinking about those prospects, but I couldn't even imagine the amount of pressure that would be on a 12 year old at the time. What's worse than just the age at which these girls got married was the treatment that they received from their husbands. Under civil law, a husband was literally allowed to physically harm his wife. In moderation, of course. It was actually a medieval tradition for husbands to quote, treat his wife as a pupil and teach her manners. As you could imagine, this made a lot of wives really mad, and so many wives offed their husbands. But things rarely got better after that because if they were caught, they would be sentenced to burn at the stake. Note to self, don't get married in medieval times. Number four, the walk of shame. We've all heard the term walk of shame at some point, but what does it really mean? And also, where did it originally come from? Well, it was originally referred to as a skimmington or rough music. I know, it doesn't mean they would blast Slipknot this whole time. This was done to wives who were bossy or overbearing. They would be forced to walk through the entire town barefoot, all those crooked, horrible stone roads, ankles just toast, it was horrible. They would also be scandally clad too because why not? Because men are making the rules, that's why. And as you guessed it, crowds would be waiting outside, all prepared to bang pans and yell horrible things at her. I guess these dudes just never had jobs. I don't know, they were just always on standby, ready to yell at a lady walking by through town, bare feet, all because she was deemed too bossy. Okay. If you're wondering who exactly is responsible for these public humiliations, um, the court. The official court. Judge Judy back in the day would be like, yes or no, did you raise your voice? Okay, case dismissed. Take your shoes off, we're done here. What a joke. At number three, ladies of the night. Sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do to get that coin, right? We all have our side hustles and dead end jobs to be able to afford rent and whatnot. And sometimes we're not exactly proud of the work that we do to make money. It was the same back in medieval times. People had to find any means to make money and for a lot of women, they used what their mama gave them to support themselves and their families. One of the more positive sides of life for women in medieval times was the fact that being a woman of the night Night was actually a recognized profession. Later on throughout the times, this profession would be deemed illegal, but in medieval times, it was as common as being a baker or something. These women were actually considered to be merchants because they sold their bodies as if it was any other sellable good. Being a woman of the night was such a common and widespread profession that nearly every town in medieval times had a brothel, even in towns with small populations. So yeah, maybe they didn't have that big of a marketplace, but they no doubt had a place where you could go see some quality mommy milkers. Number two, grand theft witchcraft. If you were a woman in the middle ages, you were accused of being a witch pretty often. They thought women communicated with the devil like Brie mentioned earlier, just because some townsfolk with three teeth said so. Great, thanks Abe, good job, good report. The punishment for practicing witchcraft wasn't a heavy fine like guys who cheated, but they would be burnt at the stake. This was popular in Scotland along with drowning. Those are the two big ones. Remember earlier how I said women would sometimes be dipped into a river or a pond? Well, they would also sometimes just be left there. It's called witch dipping, and depending on if she floated or sank, that's, you know, Witch or not, the dumbest thing I ever heard. If you were charged with treason or witchcraft, that was the ideal punishment. 
because it surely beats burning to death in front of an entire village. This all got out of control come the start of the 17th century with the Salem witch trials. That's when people were like, you know what, I think this is wrong. I think we should stop. Let's put this torch out. I think we're good. That's when 19 people were executed for being witches. God forbid you knew how to do bed mass in the Middle Ages. Also, that's a lot of coordination to get that many townsfolk together and be like, okay, you need this, you need this. How many people are standing here? Almost like you would use basic math to figure that out. You're a witch too. Spoiler alert, we're all witches because we know things. I don't know, I hate this. And finally at number one, crimes of the heart. For some unknown reason, people were really out here in these streets in medieval times trying to accuse women of everything. Witchcraft was a common accusation, but the other common crime that women were often accused of was adultery. But you see, the thing is, Someone could accuse a woman of adultery even if she never had physical contact with another person. Now, how the heck does that work, you ask? Well, it depended on where these people lived. During the medieval age in the Byzantine Empire, it was considered adultery if they spent a night outside of their husbands or parents' homes. In Slavic parts of Europe, a woman could be considered guilty of infidelity for simply going to a public event. I'm pretty sure with this logic, if you even breathe in the same general vicinity of a man, then you could be accused of adultery. I mean, what the F is that up? The only bright side, I guess, is the fact that when it came down to punishments for adultery, men usually got the worst punishments in comparison to women, however, they would be accused of this crime way less often than women, so I guess in a way we still got the short end of the stick. Damn it. At number 10, watching consummation. Back in medieval times, depending on the century, weddings either meant a lot or meant nothing at all. If it was the early medieval age, then no one really gave a hoot about marriage, and I'll get to that later. But later in the medieval age, marriage became a holy sacrament, and this sacrament had to be consummated. On the night of the couple's wedding, they would do the good old brown chicken, brown cow, boom boom pow, OMG wow, which could have been a positive or negative experience depending on circumstance, but it was also a little weird because there would be people watching it all happen. That's right guys, after the ceremony and reception, people would follow the bride and groom up to the bedroom and be like, hey Joe, grab the popcorn, we're watching the live showing of Fifty Shades of Grey. And Joe would be like, yo bet, and then that's exactly how it happened. Anyways, this was all done so that there were witnesses to the consummation so that the marriage's validity could be backed up. So if anyone tried to deny that their marriage was legit, Joe with the popcorn would be able to back up the bride and room and confirmed that everything happened. Kind of kinky, kind of weird. Number nine, dowries. Today's weddings are in so insanely expensive. I don't know if it's ever gonna happen for me for that reason alone. But uh, you know, they kind of replaced the dowry altogether. But what was a dowry? It was a set of assets, money, material, goods, real estate that would be given to the groom once the couple united. The purpose of the dowry was to entice a groom to marry the bride if he wasn't already attracted to her. A kind of, we will pay you to marry our daughter kind of vibes. But it also acts as a kind of insurance for the bride. Should the marriage end in divorce, the husband is expected to pay it back. So yes, there were indeed take backsies if things got really bad. Though considering divorce and annulments were rare and the money really never belonged to her, not the best rule to live by, but the groom would also pay something called the bride price or bride wealth. The groom was expected to pay a sum, either in assets or money, to secure a lady's hand in marriage. This implied security for the bride and their family. But yes, in both accounts, technically, a bride could be bought and sold for whatever price the family slash groom deemed appropriate. So really just a marriage pawn. On number eight, shotgun wedding. Marriage and weddings back in the medieval ages were practiced very differently compared to today. Back then, people started getting married and having kids very, very young. Usually, girls would be married off as soon as they hit puberty, so around the age of 12, and they would start popping out as many spawn as possible because the high infant mortality rate made it very difficult to grow a family. On top of the duty to further the population, these marriages weren't for love. Arranged marriages were the norm back then because it was mostly used to join families for status or alliances, or because your dad owed Billy from down the block a favor and he offered you to his son Billy Jr. Marriage 
Marriage ceremonies were also very different back then. Because marriage wasn't as big of a fuss as it is now, it didn't matter where you got married or how soon. You could get engaged in the morning and be married by lunchtime if you really wanted to. Most people didn't need permission to get married so they could hold the ceremony anywhere. Marriage ceremonies could be held in places like pubs, in the middle of the street, or even in bed. Because of this, it made it really hard to know who was married and to whom until the 12th century when it was declared a holy sacrament that must be observed by God. Number 7. No objections. So obviously, with a lot of people marrying willy nilly, a lot of marriages mostly made people miserable. Maybe. Enemies to Lovers is my favorite book trope, so who knows how spicy things actually got. I hate you, I love you, next day, I don't know. But the famous line, speak now or forever hold your peace, only got introduced in 1215 to try and flush out drama before they couldn't go back. In the Middle Ages, drama, discovered after marriage vows were exchanged, caused major problems since divorce wasn't easy or, you know, Accepted. We will get to that later. For instance, Joan of Kent, who was known for marrying Edward the Black Prince and mothering Richard II, had a secret marriage when she was 12 years old. She didn't get approved. In her early teens, she was married to an aristocrat, but the secret marriage was discovered after eight years. The papal court had to overturn it and return her to her knight. He died 11 years later, and it was after that that her cousin Edward married her. Wouldn't it have been nice to know that little detail before she married the aristocrat guy? Yeah, probably. Would've saved a lot of heartbreak, hence why the speak now or forever hold your peace was introduced. At number 6, shoes! Back in the days of old, shoes were apparently a huge staple in society. They were pointy and weird and expensive and complicated and were even integrated into marriage practices. During the wedding ceremony, it was a tradition for the father of the bride to take one of the bride's shoes and give it to the groom. The groom would then tap the bride on the head with the shoe in a token of his authority. But the shoe traditions don't stop at bopping people on the head like little bunny foo foo. You know how these days there's a tradition of throwing the bouquet at weddings, and apparently whoever catches it is the next to get married? Well that tradition sort of came from the medieval tradition of throwing shoes at weddings. Instead of throwing flowers, brides would throw shoes at their bridesmaids to determine who was next to walk down the Aisle. Now this whole bride throwing things idea has failed me before because I caught a bouquet once and I'm as single as ever so maybe someone needs to chuck a shoe at me or something this time. Please. Number 5. The Bedroom Trial So divorce, again, wasn't a thing. On the upside of dying early, it potentially meant that you weren't locked in a marriage for too long. If the marriage did end, it wasn't a divorce, it was an annulment, which was very expensive. A common reason this happened was due to consanguinity, which was close relations by blood or marriage, which was forbidden. Other grounds would be adultery, leprosy, and impotency. Also failure to concede to the marriage debt, which was the obligation for both spouses to engage sexually. It actually didn't matter where this happened. You had to do it even if it was in a church. It was a big deal. Enter the bedroom trial. Court cases from the 14th century show records that bedroom trials took place that would determine whether a marriage should continue. The bedroom part is exactly as it sounds. The man and the woman were placed in a bed together and were to be watched by the wise women for several nights. If over the course of the night the man's member remains of no use, i.e. impotence, then it was determined that the marriage should end. But the wise women were most likely either complete strangers strangers or the groom's grandmother. So I doubt that would have helped with the getting it up part. Poor guys. At number 4, marrying the country. If you married an entire country, does that count as polygamy? Are you technically married to everyone in the country or just the one country as a singular unit? These are the shower thoughts that I wish I could ask medieval queens, but unfortunately they died a long long time ago along with their marriage secrets and probably some recipes for poison too. Back to this whole marrying the country idea though. Back in the medieval age, when someone became queen, they had to get married more than once. For them, it wasn't just about marrying their spouse, they also had to marry their country. This process was called consecration, and it was something that a ruler had to go through in order to be a legitimate queen. The queen would go through a symbolic marriage to the realm, complete with prayers and a blessing and a ring and a crown. It was essentially like a real wedding, except the groom was a nation of people. Sounds like a happy marriage to me. Yeah. Number 3. The Veil 
as we have determined so far in our list, love wasn't the primary reason for marriage, especially for nobles. So as a result, there were quite a significant amount of arranged marriages. Besides the symbolism of humility and purity, it was also used as a way of disguising the bride entirely. The bride would often be wrapped from head to toe to protect her from evil spirits. This tradition goes all the way back to ancient Roman times. That's one explanation, but during arranged marriages, it was more literally used to hide the face of the bride from the groom. So if he didn't like what he saw after he literally unwrapped the package, well, too bad, she's yours now. Eventually veils progressed to being much smaller, but the tradition of revealing the bride to the husband to declare ownership remained a tradition, even to this day, kind of, except now it's more romantically idealized. Do you see Priyanka Chopra's awesome veil in that, you know the one. At number two, long distance marriage. You know how during the pandemic people started having Zoom weddings? Well, in a way, people have been doing something similar since the medieval ages. Back then, a lot of weddings were simply for political reasons, and so a big ceremony was rarely needed. So when two people from different kingdoms were getting married, they didn't necessarily need to be there for the wedding. Instead, they could send proxies and have someone marry their new spouse on their behalf. This would be the legal binding of marriage, you know, the paper work side of things. But once both parties could finally meet in person, then they would hold a second ceremony with all the pomp and circumstance that you would expect. And yes, it still included the whole watching the consummation thing. Ew. This proxy marriage actually happened to Marie Antoinette and her brother was her proxy until she could get to the formal ceremony. So now we know that even back then you didn't have to show up on time to your own wedding and you could just get someone else to do it. Sounds a little cold to me, but like I've said before, love is dead and it died a long time ago. Mic drop, thank you. Number one, last but not least, and this is the most messed up, the Lord's Right. This one is definitely the most messed up tradition and I don't even know how it was justified in the first place. Like why was it even in place? Someone clearly clearly made this happen so they could piss people off. The last thing anyone wants at their wedding is someone interfering with the wedding night. As we know, people for the most part had to observe the ceremony, but the Lord's right was something even more horrific. The droit de seigneur was a feudal right that existed in medieval Europe that gave the lord of the land the right to sleep with the bride on the first night of the marriage. That's right, so most often they would take the bride's virginity. Now just how often this rite was carried through is debated, but if your lord had a particular vendetta against you, it wouldn't be surprising. This rite could also extend to a lord taking the virginity of every woman in the village. Even if they didn't want to get married, it was ridiculous. However, late Middle Age and Renaissance era texts don't clearly determine whether this practice ever occurred. Texts from 15th century Switzerland references the Lord of Mar demanding the right of the first knight or a hefty fee. So either you pay for it, or I do it. The Dois de Seigneur was depicted in Mel Gibson's Braveheart, which added to the infamy of the idea, but no physical evidence determines whether any lord actually did it, but it did technically exist. Gross. Okay, number 10, location, location, location. So first off, let's begin at the very foundation as to why medieval castles were built in the first place. And the biggest hint lies in where they were built. From the 11th century onwards, medieval castles were built for a few reasons. One, to demonstrate wealth. Two, provide a place of defense and retreat. And thirdly, to defend important passageways and landways. Oh, and uh, it was a nice place to live. But specifically because of the last few reasons, where a castle was built really, really really mattered. Some were built by the sea to have a strong advantage over naval attacks, or they were built on hilltops just like you see in the movies. The more they could see, the better the chance they had of anticipating the enemy's attack. But even still, some castles took this idea to the extreme, such as Castle Monte Titano, which literally looks like it's about to fall off of a cliff any moment, or Pradjemski Castle, which was built into the side of a cliff face and is only partially visible from the outside. This would definitely make it difficult for anyone to attack the fortress given the rough terrain, but still, like, how did they even build that? How did you even build it? I don't even know. Just the talent, pure talent. Number nine, helmeted cock. No. I'm not talking about what you think I'm talking about. Think about how much entertainment you consume on a daily basis. You're watching me right now, scrolling on TikTok, Instagram, movies, Netflix, whatever you want to do. The desire for entertainment is strong in humanity, so medieval nobles found ways to insert the funnies into everything they could, even food. Helmeted cock was one such entertaining delicacy that delighted all of the guests behind the castle walls. It was essentially a rooster stitched to a pig and then roasted. Another game they used to play with their food was live frog and chicken. They would put live frogs into pie shells so that when someone cut into it, all these frogs would just 
ribbit about the dinner table. Hilarity! And then live chicken was significantly darker. They'd pluck a live chicken in boiling water in front of the guests, like in a jacuzzi, and when it passed out, they'd glaze it to look like it was cooked. Then they would lay it on the table, and when the chicken finally came to, it would bound up and down the table to the delight of the guests. This poor chicken who's like frantically being like, where the heck are my feathers? I'm naked. Just awful. Weird times. Weird, weird times. What else were they gonna do? Number eight, the art of dying. To see where I'm going with this, check out this pic. Why does he look so calm? He's literally being stabbed in the head and like the side and everywhere else. While in real life this wouldn't actually happen, you wouldn't be this calm if you were being killed, but this was the goal. People lived in a very pious society back in the medieval ages, and what with death looming around every corner with the Black Plague, you know, they developed a very unique idea about death called Ars Moriendi, the art of dying. The idea revolved around a good Christian death, that it should be planned and peaceful. I'm going to die on December 16th, blah, 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 whatever date. They didn't actually say that, but anyways. So as medieval people were lying on their deathbed in their castle, they were expected to perceive it without despair or any kind of existential crisis. You had to take it honorably and if you didn't it was looked down on but then again you were also dead so what does that matter but it was because of this belief that even in paintings depicting gore and death the victim who was stabbed in the head always had like a calm expression which is like yeah this is fine it's a flesh wound number seven a jester versus Netflix. As soon as I said jester, you pictured a tight wearing, colorful bard with a stupid hat. Probably not far off, but the nobles had to entertain themselves somehow as previously mentioned. The castle would play host to loads of minstrels, jugglers, and acrobats. Edward II, for instance, in 1306, had hundreds at his knighting celebration. But the original meaning of the jester was just simply a good storyteller. They would wander in on dark evenings and entertain the company with fancy tales, comedic and dramatic but soon jesters became employed full time to kings and lords. Henry II had one called Roland the Musical Farter. Very name. I wonder what he did. Every Christmas he would perform and earn a grant of the land, so they were paid pretty well. He had to be wise and quick witted in order to maintain the love of their masters. However, if they went too far. Off with her head. Tribule, the king of France's fool, once went too far and was sentenced to execution, but he got out of it when they allowed him to choose how he would die. He simply said, old age, and he was pardoned. Again, quick witted. Number six, gazing out of windows. Imagining a world where women are restricted from education, business, autonomy, is thankfully getting harder and harder to do. But even without feminism, women still operated within the constraints of a patriarchal society in very important ways. It was their job to run the entire castle when the lord was away, for instance. They weren't just staring out windows, waiting to lower their hair for a handsome suitor. Medieval noblewomen, for instance, had the responsibility of running the household and enforcing it. Lords were often away on crusades Crusades, war, court, or even just dead. So it was up to the ladies to run the estate, finances, and even to defend the castle against attack. Also, if the husband was dead, many women would choose not to remarry because you had more advantages being a widow than being married. You would essentially be treated as a man, especially in terms of property and things like that. Religion was also incredibly important, and one of the restrictions for women at the time was that they were forbidden from touching the altar. So in order to metaphorically dance around this, they donated their their clothes to the church, which would eventually be worn by the clergymen, hence they would eventually touch the altar. A very clever way of getting around this rule, but more research needs to be done about women in the medieval ages, but this is kind of what it looked like. Number 5. Shotgun Weddings Behind the closed doors of the castle walls, love lives were pretty much what you would expect them to be. Really stinky, and also not about love. Marriage was politically motivated and there wasn't room for much love there. Women have women had essentially no say and both boys and girls could be married as soon as 12 to 14. However, compared to today, their ceremonies would be better compared to a shotgun wedding in Vegas than the ones we know. It would be completed in a matter of moments just by simply uttering consent. You could marry technically in the street or at dinner or at a pub or in bed after the deed is done. So, because things got so confusing by the 12th century, marriage got more complicated. It was declared a holy sacrament that must be observed by God. Observed being the key word. Not only did people actually have to see people saying I do, they had to see them do the deed. The bride was carried to the bed by the family and they would wait around until the act was complete. So you know what I mean. If you were lucky enough to live in a castle, you might have had bed curtains to shield the viewing, but they, they still heard everything that was going on. 
Number 4 The Mystery of Ludlow Castle Beyond weird weddings, war and strange food performances, castles contain secrets behind their walls we may never know, such as the mystery of the White Lady of Ludlow Castle. In the 12th century, the castle was home to Marion de la Bruyere and she had a secret. She was in love with a secret suitor with whom she would sneak into the castle each night. She would lower a rope in true Rapunzel fashion to bring her love to her. But little did she know that her mysterious love was setting a trap for her. One night he left the rope below so that more men could follow up behind him and take the castle. Bereft and betrayed, Marion stabbed her lover with his own sword. She then flung herself from the castle's walls and perished on the rocks below. To this day, people have stories of seeing a woman's white figure tumbling from the castle window, trapped in the desperate circumstances of her death. Number 3 Secret Passageways If I am ever <laughs> Ever in my life, able to actually afford a house. We'll see. One of the ride or die requirements is a secret passageway or to a secret library. Like both. Both would be great, but a secret library is a must. And I will never tell anyone about it because how cool would it be if they found it themselves? Medieval castles were filled with secret passageways and alcoves designed to help facilitate escape should the need arise. In fact, it was kind of a requirement of fortifications to have one. The main secret entrance was called the Postern. It was small, therefore easy to defend and protected by metal grates, as well as there were battlements above it. However, the entrance could be exploited if in the wrong hands. Say you have some double crossers behind your walls. They could help sneak in the enemy soldiers, such as the case of Corfe Castle during the Siege of 1645. An officer named Colonel Pittman helped aid enemy troops in through the postern, condemning the fate of the fort. Number 2 Where's the loo? <laughs> there are so many reasons to be thankful for modern day plumbing, but this reason above the rest. Because of plumbing, we don't need a gong farmer. What is a gong farmer? I'm not glad you asked. In castles, bathrooms were often called gongs or loos, and often overhung over the moat or onto the ground so that like whatever was happening would just drop below. There was a wooden board with a hole in it, you sat on it, did your business and got up. Simply straightforward. But sometimes the droppings fell into a cesspit like in Rochester Castle. The smell would rise up and though they didn't know about germs, they believed bad smells were unhealthy. So eventually, the pit had to be cleaned. Enter the gong farmer. This is a dirty job that even Mike Rowe would run from. They had to scoop out the stuff ferry it away and bury it. It was a dangerous job too and one poor fellow named Richard the Raker fell into one and drowned. Now that's a way to go. And last but not least, the Tower of London Zoo? The Tower of London has seen a lot of action since it was built by William the Conqueror in the 1070s. It has housed some of history's most famous political prisoners, but did you know that at one time it was kind of a zoo? From the 1200s to 1835, the tower housed an exotic assortment of wild animals. Lions, tigers, bears, oh my, but also elephants, monkeys, and polar bears. They were brought to the castle as gifts, and if you visit the attraction now, there are wire sculptures commemorating the beasts. In 1235, Henry III was given leopards, though most likely they were lions, but they were just called that, by the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II. And that's where it all began. The king decided to start a zoo at the tower, and that he did. A polar bear joined the exhibit in 1252, and then an African elephant in 1255. A special enclosure was built, but sadly the elephant died only a couple years later, which was sadly the fate of most of the animals. Except for the lions, they did pretty well. Kicking off the list at number 10. Boiling. Whenever I get in a bath that's too hot, I think of the medieval times. I can't help it. I can't believe this was once a real thing. I get chills thinking about it. Either water or oil would be used for this ancient punishment. To die by being boiled, that was reserved for those who poisoned others. So if you have any vials of poison, toss it. Don't do it, man. Trust me. In 1531, the time King Henry VIII was running the show, they made boiling a capital punishment. So poisoning somebody back then was equal to treason. Therefore, it was agreed you should be boiled slowly in front of of like a room full of people. I would say that's the worst, but I know what's also to come on this list. Number nine, water. Taking a step away from the worst physical thing one could possibly go through, let's take a look at how far the mind will go before it too breaks. Sensory deprivation is still around today. In fact, there's many who pay for it. Yeah, they lie in a dark tub full of salt, then they float and listen to Childish Gambino. It's a magical experience. Your senses are powerful, especially combined with water. So this dripping machine, this old water punishment, that was just all bad. You had ice cold water dripping on your forehead and your face over and over for hours and hours. Drops would be at different random times so you can predict it as well. My toes are wiggling while I'm talking about this. This is making me anxious right now. In medieval times, they would tie you down and then using a horn, a big ass funnel, they would pour nine pints of water down into your, down your, down your throat. 
So water is horrible in many ways. Number eight, fire. Can't talk about medieval punishments without mentioning this witchy classic. Commonly practiced in Babylonia and ancient Israel, then later on in Europe with the classic witch hunts, burning at the stake didn't come from churches, like many believe. They didn't call the shots there at all. That was mainly how small towns settled local beef. Yeah, by burning at the stake, instead of just like a fist fight at the park. Burning at the stake came in full swing way back in 1431 in France. French disbelievers like Joan of Arc, they were burned at the stake. It was crazy that they actually did this as a form of punishment. This is one of the worst medieval punishments. And believe me, there's a little bit of a silver lining here. It was quicker than most. Sometimes. Gunpowder was sometimes used so that the burning and stuff would be much faster and brighter and louder and much more horrible. A lot worse on paper, but a lot faster. So honestly, I think it's better. History is insane. Another red hot punishment used in medieval times was when the accused had to hold a red hot iron bar and then walk a few steps with it. A red hot iron bar, your hands were literally toast at that point. Here's where it gets even worse though. Three days later, the accused would come back to the court and then when the bandages were removed, if their hands were healing, they started to heal, they were deemed innocent. They were on the path to goodness and whatever. If their hands were still in horrible condition from say, I don't know, holding a red hot iron bar, then they were pronounced guilty. That's how the courts worked back then. Number seven, the rack. On to something not so hot and fast, but rather dull and slow, the rack is surprisingly well known. It was originally introduced to the Tower of London around 1420. The Duke of Exeter referred to this device as his daughter. What a weirdo. It's like guys who call their car like she. It's like, okay, just a little bit too close to your automobile, man. Relax. It was an open bed frame type device where your ankles were tied at the bottom and your hands were tied at the top. Already we're off to a horrible start. It was horizontal as well and sometimes it was up. It was, it was all bad. They would just leave you hanging by these ropes and these ropes were slowly tightened more and more, obviously causing some problems to muscles and joints that were, you know, holding things in place. This was done to extract information. This is also one of the worst things I've heard. Even getting tickled like this would be horrible. I couldn't even imagine. I make jokes because I'm uncomfortable, honestly. Hit that thumbs up to spread some good vibes because we're not even halfway done, folks. Number six, molten metal. This was another form of cow capital punishment, and if you've seen Game of Thrones, it'll ring a familiar bell. A few of these do, actually, yikes. Metal would be heated up in a cauldron for a long, long time to the point where it was liquid, it was molten metal, just a soup of minerals. Look, we said this video wasn't for the faint-hearted, and here at Bumblebee, we like to keep that promise. They would then pour the molten metal on your head, or more commonly known, this would they pour it down the throat of the accused. Obviously, it wasn't done as a method to extract information, it was done to brutally end someone's life. Because they're not talking after that, of course. Execution by molten metal was supposedly done to a wealthy Roman general, Marcus Licinius Crassus, back in ancient times. The metal would burn your muscles and skin, literally cooking it, and then after a few moments, it would harden. Bad, bad, not good. Number five keel hauling. Not to be confused with kegels, keel hauling was reserved for the worst of the worst at sea. This was used by pirates for sailors who disobeyed orders and all that jazz. The victim would be suspended by a rope with rocks or weights around their ankles, then they're lowered to the keel of the ship where all the sharp barnacles live. After so long, these ships are so old, it's just piled on layers and layers of barnacles. Then they would get dragged all along them with the water and everything. Water plus pain, it's a lot. It's a deadly combination. Anything to do with barnacles in the sea, no chance. I'll literally tell you anything, Blackbeard. Anything. Number four, solitary confinement. This is a kind of punishment that still exists in our modern society, but it can truly be one of the worst punishments out there because of the type of psychological distress that it causes. We were all just in a pandemic for so long. We got so bored and we had Netflix and iPads and I whatevers. I can't even imagine this back in the day. Basically, it's a prisoner living in a single cell with little to no contact with anybody else. Not even like a guard or anything rattling keys like in the old times. It was just nothing. No one would even check on them. There are many stories about people being locked up for so long they forget about their families. And some people have gone away to solitary confinement for so long that once they're out, they just forget how to speak, really. They forget how to be a human and interact in the real world. Solitary confinement and the negative effects that it has on a person is becoming a wider topic of conversation because of the effects on a person's mental well-being, and it's a topic for a lot of human rights organizations. Back in medieval times, solitary confinement was literally just a room made of stones. It was pitch black, freezing cold, you were tucked away below some janky castle, and most of the time, you weren't really alone. In the dark, nibbling away your little piggies were number three rats another game of thrones classic if you're a rat person i know there's a lot of people who do tricks with their pet rat 
That's cool, but maybe cover Stuart Little's eyes for this one. Rats as a medieval punishment, where do I even start? Okay, this one was a punishment for the rats at the same time. What was once called a rat trap involved a man or woman being tied down to something and then a metal enclosure would be strapped down to their chest or their stomach. Now inside this metal enclosure, there's rats, which are also just loose walking around and the person could feel them, the little feet walking around in their skin. And this is when the person instilling the punishment begins heating the other end of the metal enclosure Historically, it was hot coals that were usually placed on top or there's a fire underneath, which quickly creates a hot environment for the rats inside. From there, the rats begin frantically searching for a way out, but because it's made of metal and they can't bite through that, they find your skin and then that they can obviously bite through. So you can paint the picture in your head. It's disgusting. Number two, the breaking wheel. The breaking wheel is literally just a large disc, a pirate ship wheel almost just lying there where somebody is then tied to it and everybody else just hammers them and beats the shit out of them over and over. But of course, since we're talking about medieval times, everything has to be a show and whatnot. So once the accused was beaten and then presumed dead, the wheel would lift up and turn just to show everybody what's up. Another way to use the breaking wheel, yep, there was more than one, again, creative folks back then, they would tie a person to the wheel and then continue to rotate it and then all the ropes below would get tighter and tighter and twist. Kind of like the rack, but with a literal twist. And finally coming in at number one, the brazen bull. This one takes the rat's problem and then makes it a you problem. Out of all the ones on this list, the brazen bull is the last one that I would do straight up haunting. It's also been referred to as a Sicilian bull and basically it's not too complex. There is a bronze sculpture often in the shape of, you guessed it, a bull. But in medieval times, it was just a big closed cauldron and usually it was large enough to fit a person inside. Yeah, this was in a Saw movie too, I believe. That's how you know it's a good one when it's in the movie Saw. So once the person was locked inside or it was leaned over so they couldn't get out, a fire would then be set underneath this bull and then you can probably figure out the rest in your head. They would even engineer the bull so that when somebody screamed, it sounded like a bull's roar. How fun is that? How fun is history? Number 10, starting off strong with animal court. That's right, in the middle ages apparently, it was a regular thing that animals would be put on trial. It was believed that animals who committed a crime were possessed by the devil. Of course they were, of course. And to let them go unpunished would give the devil the permission to take over human affairs. You don't want that, so they would be put on trial. Everything from hogs, beetles, rats, mice, cockerels, all have a history of being put on trial. In the 14th century, local people even prosecuted Spanish flies. Spanish flies were dangerous to livestock and would ruin vegetation, so needless to say, they weren't well liked. And they were appointed a lawyer, what kind of lawyer back then? No idea. And given great dignity in court, though the verdict was not favorable. They were condemned and banished from a plot of land. How exactly they enforced this? Who knows? An anywhere wedding, number nine. Apparently, back in the Middle Ages, shotgun weddings were like the thing. It was the to do. One must simply exchange a sincere vow for another, or not even sincere. It could be like, you wanna get married? Yeah, cool, awesome. And two people could be married. Considering the hot blood of the youth, this could happen anywhere, even after they had already done the deed. Therefore, keeping track of who was married to who got pretty confusing. So then the church finally decided to make marriage a holy sacrament which must be observed by God but not only God the families had to make sure the ceremony was official all the way to the wedding night very often the bride would be carried to the marriage bed by the family who would then stay to view the consummation of the union that's right the tickly boo the boo boo the jiggy that yeah that's right your parents your in-laws would wait until they saw you get jiggy with it. Number eight, the dancing plague. Not as much of a tradition, but an event that almost became one. When I first learned about the dancing plague, I was speechless and hopefully you will be too. Keep in mind the middle ages weren't colorless, but there were some pretty bleak times. Doctors debate whether this event was caused by bacteria in rye that can cause hallucinations like LSD, but no one can really be sure. It just kind of happened and it's well documented. All people know is that in Strasbourg in July of 1518, a woman named Frau Trophia started dancing in the street 
and by the end of the week, 40 people joined in, and by the end of the month, 400 people joined in. It was nuts. It was like a massive never ending rave. Initially, physicians thought folks were just stressed out, so they even brought in professional dancers and musicians to like encourage the joyousness, but then people started dying from heart attacks and fatigue. So by that point, they were like, oh, we better cut this off, and so they whisked everyone off to uh, the mountaintop to pray, and apparently that prayed the dancing away. Number seven, men's fashion. I may be making a big statement here, but considering men's fashion has been variations of the tux for over two centuries now, kind of, eh, that's a stretch. This may be one of, if not the most colorful periods of men's fashion. Men got pretty risky when with their attire, like you're kind of impressed. Anglo-Saxon men wore tunics, trousers, leggings, and strappy leather shoes tied together with belts and girdles. Doesn't sound too crazy yet, but wait. Cod pieces were in, and tunics got shorter so they could see their front manhood. Also, very long shoes were a big thing. Uh, the longer the shoes, the richer you appeared, and the more pronounced the cod piece. Well, I think you... I think you get the picture. Men who wore pointier shoes had a higher social position. Some shoes were so long that they had to be reinforced with a whalebone. They also adorned wide brim hats, felt caps, and hoods to protect their eyes during extreme weather. Number six, sexy and hairless. Women, on the other hand, had some even stranger qualifiers for beauty. Uh, while today having a thick and bold soap brow and a full head of hair is the ideal, it was the exact opposite for women in the Middle Ages. We have literally almost tried everything and I fear what happens next like women's fashion we just we've done a lot of stuff anyways in the Middle Ages a woman's forehead was considered the sexiest part of their face why no idea maybe because her breath was so bad it was better to kiss her forehead who knows but either way it was a big deal so what women used to do to draw attention to it was pluck their eyebrows hairline and ashes away to make sure it highlighted that part of their face. So at very often they would just have no eyelashes, no eyebrows, and like their hair would be like this far back. Number five, Feast of Fools. The Feast of Fools was a very popular festival in the Middle Ages where everything turned topsy-turvy. On January 1st, specifically in France, they would elect a mock bishop or pope and low and high officials would change places. Kind of like an adaptation of the pagan celebration of Saturnalia, which we talked about in another video. Find it and post it below. People would wear hideous masks to conceal themselves from the festivities so they could behave fully in the activities. There would be parades throughout the city featuring drinking, singing, men would dress as women and vice versa, along with the general mischief. Even priests and clergy would be seen wearing masks during office hours and dance as women, panders, or minstrels. It was officially banned in the 15th century because it got too ridiculous and you know the piety of the people were like, this is a sin. But despite the ban, it still continued into the 16th century. It seems like a pretty hard party to imagine, especially considering how pious they were back then. Priests dancing in women's clothes? Crazy. I mean, technically they're already wearing kind of dresses, their long tunics. Number four, bloodletting. Along with traditions, there were certain medical practices that medieval physicians swore by. The most popular being bloodletting. Got a headache? Bloodletting. Have a flesh wound? Bloodletting. The plague? Hmm. Bloodletting. Emotions? Uh, maybe a little bit of bloodletting. It is exactly as it sounds. They would either make cuts to let the blood drip, or more usually, place leeches on the skin. The rationale behind bloodletting, though, is really important. It was related to the belief in the four basic humors, blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile. This translated to the four basic elements, earth, air, fire, and water. Being ill meant something was off with the humors, and therefore relieving an excess of humor was necessary. Therefore, if there was an excess of blood, it would be removed by bloodletting. If it was bile, they would purge it. Uh, blood was declared the dominant humor by Galen of Pergamum way back in 200 AD. So bloodletting became the most popular. This tradition even lasted beyond the Middle Ages into the 18th century. In the 1800s, the French went through 40 million leeches a year, uh, and also things started to get weird when George Washington was bloodlet when he had got, fell sick with a cold. He died that way. It was a lot. Number three, here lies the heart. 
as you can expect, death was everywhere in the Middle Ages. I probably, I wouldn't have made it past the age of four. I had tonsillitis too many times. That's probably true for most of us. Making it past child rearing years for women was outstanding. For men, you'd be lucky if you made it past 30. Tough times. So it only makes sense we talk about some of their unusual funeral rites. There were many superstitions around burials, fear of disease and even vampirism determined what would happen to the body. Eastern Europeans would stake bodies through the heart in order to keep them from returning. Especially if they had taken their own life, they would have to be beheaded. When a village was cursed by plague, drought, flooding or something other, they would dig up the bodies to investigate, sometimes burning them because they thought, ooh, wow, what's happening? Their nails are retracting, they must be a vampire. During plague time, the normal burial methods were abandoned and they had to resort to mass graves. But on the battlefield, there was actually a very sweet tradition. If a loved one died on the field and the body could not be transported back, the heart would be removed instead. It would either be kept in a box of ivory with spices or buried somewhere. Number two, the mystery plays. If you weren't busy trying to avoid the black dead, then you might have attended something called a mystery play. Mystery plays were a sequence of performances referred to at times as the cycle plays. During the 15th and 16th century, before playhouses were even a thing, these plays were performed annually in the biggest towns in Britain. They were called mystery plays because they primarily addressed the miraculous mysteries of God himself. Throughout the whole course of the day, the whole arc of the universe from Garden of Eden all the way to Judgment Day was performed. They were organized and funded by acting guilds, which was another reason as to why they were called mystery plays. The troops themselves were called mysteries. The troops were often made up of craftsmen who would use the show to show off their wares. The performers were ordinary people with a flair for the dramatic, but they had to be damn good, otherwise they would get vegetables thrown at them. People looked forward to these performances all year round, so it was standing O or nothing. And last but not least, soccer. Like most sports, soccer actually has a pretty violent origin, kind of like lacrosse, though it was still considered a game. Soccer, aka the more accurate title, I have to say football, because football had far less rules. It could have an infinite number of players and could take part across an entire village. The goals were sometimes set miles apart and the game would often be used to settle disputes. As a result, they would they got they got violent. They got really, really violent. You could you could do absolutely anything in order to get the ball, save actually taking someone's life. It also wasn't strictly football, you could use any part of your body to, to get there. Wrestling, punching, kicking, scratching, tripping, you name it. If it got you a goal, fair game. But it is all fun and games until someone's eye gets poked out. In 1314, King Edward II decided it was time to put a damper on the game that was causing too much injury and property damage. He forbade the games and condemned any who disobeyed to imprisonment, but you can imagine that people didn't play by those rules either because uh, soccer still exists today somehow. Number 10, Gucci to the socks. Man of Musa may be the richest human to have ever walked planet Earth. The ninth emperor of the Mali Empire made his massive fortune by exploiting his country's salt and gold production. It is estimated his wealth today would be worth $400 billion US. That is a lot of money. That is a lot of shkarol. It is however difficult to place an exact number on his wealth, as this was a very long time ago, and it is difficult to separate his wealth from the actual monarch itself. However, in his travels in hopes of securing new trade deals, he wanted to show off his good faith and wealth. When he arrived in Mecca, it was time for a shopping spree, where the wealthy king spent so much gold it actually ruined the economy. Yeah, it ruined the economy of Mecca. Honestly, that's just a big Bruce Wayne play right there. Imagine spending so much money, you single-handedly raise the inflation rate in a major city. And also a few others. He, that wasn't the only place he did it, surprisingly. He also bragged at one point that gold grows like plants where he's from. Where I'm from, it's super cold and there's lots of snow. We aren't selling snow yet, right? Number nine. Bad Vlad. Vlad the Impaler is Vlad the Impaler. Okay, sure, he wasn't the wealthiest king ever and his empire wasn't that big. But listen, I called the chief last night and he said he ain't it. Vlad was best known for his creative um, punishments to say the least. Vlad was just the kind of guy who took some folks he didn't like and, you know, 
and paled them with large wooden or steel stakes. Vladdy did not discriminate either. While a lot of poor people did end up with the worst suppository ever, he also ended up unaliving some wealthier folk too. This one time at band camp, Vlad had two guys come visit, and when he asked them to remove their hats, as was custom in Vlad's kingdom, they refused, which in hindsight was a really bad idea because then Vlad had their hats nailed to their heads so that they may never remove them again. What were poor people going to do? Try and overthrow the guy who left their family members on pikes as some really weird art installation? Truth be told, I've heard too much about this guy for me to even come close to his kingdom. I'm good over here. I don't need to be anywhere near him. You stay over there, I'll be over here. It's all good. Number eight, Return of the Mac. Okay, so you guys know Rome, right? Beautiful ancient city, monuments, aqueducts, a big scary army with red brooms on top of their heads for some reason. Mamma mia, it's beautiful. But it didn't last forever. After many years of conquest and living well, it eventually decayed and sort of split in half with the west and east. The east becoming known as the Byzantine Empire, which it honestly did pretty well for itself too. This includes the adventures of Basil II. He's nicknamed the Bulgar Slayer. For video games out there, Doom Slayer is a big dude in green armor that does what exactly? slays demons. So that means Basil slays Bulgars. Huh? Yeah, real nice dude. With his financial might and power, he was able to conquer Bulgaria, which lasted a long time actually. And by the time of his death, Basil was the wealthiest man in Byzantine. A classic tale of a man in charge exploiting and pillaging those less fortunate. Number 7. Off with his belly. King Henry VIII was a guy known for a few shady things. Removing your wife's head because you want a new wife isn't exactly the nicest way to go about divorce. I could think of some nasty other stuff too. I don't know what the f I'm saying. I think what was rather more interesting, however, was the king's diet and the quality of life divide between royalty and peasants, especially compared to the average person at the time. Sure, he was the king, but the list of foods and menus that were available to him were crazy, even by today's standards, almost rivaling the wealthy of today. His banquets would often include pork, chicken, fish, goose, beef, fruit, bread, and desserts galore. Extravagant desserts with beautiful designs. And of course, you gotta have some wine to wash that all down with, which funny enough might have made them healthier to drink wine since water purification at the time wasn't so great. It is said he was consuming way more than the average person's calorie intake. Also, not to mention his food was fresh, or as fresh as it could be for the time. And if it wasn't, it was seasoned and preserved with very expensive spices from the far reaches of the globe. Spices that no normal person can get their hands on. The average person may not have been starving, but the quality of food and lack of fresh proteins show you what the almighty gold coin can do. Could someone please pass me the turkey? Number 6. The Cowardly Lion Richard I was the king of England for a decent amount of time, but didn't spend a lot of time of it in England. He spent most of his time raising taxes so he could fund his international warmongering. After all, that's kind of what history is about. History doesn't usually remember the times we were super friendly and got along. Which brings us to the Crusades! After recapturing Acre in 1191, his enemy Saladin was considering options of what to do next, and also considering uh, prisoner swaps, which actually was common for the time. Sadly, Saladin may have been taken too long, or may have been planning a re-retake of the city, because Richard had waited too long. Not sure what Saladin was up to, he took prisoners from Acre who were poor civilians and soldiers up onto a nearby hill in full view of Saladin and slaughtered 3,000 people. He's remembered for being Richard the Lionheart for his bravery. All I'm saying is that it's not very brave to kill innocent poor civilians. War as hell, I guess. Number 5. Nothing is true. Everything is permitted. The Medici family didn't exactly live around the medieval times, but fairly close. That being said, the family is something similar to the Kardashians of today. No, not a hit reality show based around wealthy women who sit around their mansion all day looking for a good verbal argument. No, but rather a well-known family who had extreme wealth and as time went on gained a lot more wealth and power. The Medici got their wealth by being successful bankers. And when you got money, you got power. And they owned a lot of property and had clients in multiple cities. Some family members would later become royalty like Catherine de' Medici, and even more powerful by some family members becoming next to the Lord himself as the Pope. Which if you're into that sort of thing, you would know how serious that position really is. What I'm getting at is, you don't get that powerful without breaking a few eggs. They use money and power to manipulate and they got their way. Number 4. Diaper Sniper. Alright, 
This one's messed up, but that's just how things were. Marriage is a beautiful matrimony between two loving people that has a harmonious, lasting lifetime. Tell that to people in divorce court and see where that gets you. While we may marry for love today, things were a little bit different back in the oldie times. Marriage was oftentimes a business opportunity or a peace treaty of sorts, and other versions of marriage would have you on a certain dateline show with Chris Hansen. I'm talking about girls getting married at the old refined age of 12. Yuck. It's just how it was. At the time, that was considered the age of maturity. But I mean, if you only live until you're 35, it kind of makes sense, I guess. While most of these cases are from poor people, at the end of the day, they were women and simply could not own business and property that men could. So it's in the best interest that a wealthy man marries a poor girl. Gotta do what you gotta do, I guess. Number three, dyslexia for cure found. I don't know about you guys, but sometimes reading can be really hard. You've seen my blooper reel. I mean, I went to school, I got my grade 10, and that's really cool. Maybe soon I'll be able to go to college and get my PFD. But I wasn't a big fan of school. I just like to hang out with my friends. But then again, I did have the opportunity to attend school. The same cannot be said for poor peasants in the medieval age. Some wealthy kings would go as far as to ban the serfs from learning to read. Wouldn't want your population to be too smart. They might overthrow you after all. And sorry, ladies, that means you aren't going either. Schools were boys clubs. No girls allowed. The richest of families could have their son sent off to be a squire and eventually enter knightship for their royal throne. But this was for the very rich. I can't help but think that I would look good in all that metal armor though. Give me a sword, a shield, noble steed. I'm assuming the wealthy would let me go to school. Please sir, could I learn to read? Number two, do you require a bowel movement sir? Kings will be kings and sometimes they do some things that shouldn't be things. Meet the royal groom of the stool, a man who must follow the king around with a ye olde porta potty or really just a bull, where he would be ready to assist the royal in a release of his bowels. Originally created by King Henry VIII, the groom's job was to assist the king with a box to relieve himself, also carrying towels and water, even monitoring the outcome of such daily events. After all, he's the king, gotta keep tabs on his diet. It's also rumored that the kings may have even required assistance in hygiene after the fact, which I mean, come on, I know we all need help sometimes, but that's a tad much. With all the disease and not hand washing at the time, I'm not really sure anyone ate food ever again. Ooh. Number one, dead end job. Wiping a royal bum is tough, but cleaving a man's head from his body kinda sucks too. The rich uphold the law, and that means when it's time for the death penalty, somebody's gotta do it. Somebody with less money and somebody who might not have a choice as professional unalivers at the time often were handed down the blood soaked acts of their kin. On one hand, you have law and order that is respected. On the other hand, you have a profession that sees law and order through, but is not that well respected. Makes sense that the job kind of sucks though. Unalivers often had to practice their skills and eventually worked their way up to the real McCoy. Practicing on pumpkins, animals, and eventually criminals. If they got it wrong, i.e. too many swings of the axe, people would rush and attack their unaliver. Despite what movies and cartoons may make you think, these people did have empathy for what they were doing. And because of their social status, a lot of them live lonely lives. Kicking off the list at number 10, leave. One of the first things you'd want to do if you magically were able to travel back to the Middle Ages is come right back. Yeah, it's not knights in shining armor and drinking unlimited IPAs in a heated cot. It was the Dark Ages. It sucked. More often than not, if you lived through the Middle Ages, you never left your village. Because where would you go? The world is also dark and dangerous. Nothing's built yet. You can't warm up in a coffee shop until your Uber arrives, right? Most travelers just slept outside or under some bushes. Records from that time show that the average person didn't travel in their entire life. The rest of this list should also explain why. Number nine, forget a watch. It's pretty easy to find out what time it is today. You can check your smartphone, you can check your watch, you can check your smart watch. We have everything. We don't even have to adjust the hours anymore during daylight savings. That's how easy it is now. You don't even notice anymore. You're like, why is it all of a sudden? Oh, got it. Apple, so good. Back in the Middle Ages, obviously it was harder to check the time. Minutes didn't even exist yet. Yeah, that was that tripped me out when I was reading this. The day was divided by seven long hours. They used water clocks, sundials, all that jazz, but none of them could really tell time to the minute. That long ago, the idea of a minute wasn't a thing. Christian monks were on a tight schedule for work and prayer, so they were actually the first recorded timekeepers in medieval Europe. Imagine being referred to as a <laughs> recorded timekeeper. What time is it? I'm like, Eight. They're like, yo, he's good. Let's get out of here. This guy's so good. Even so, the length of those hours depends on what time of year it is. Winter and summer months matter. As a Canadian, let me tell you, these dark, cold winters really do suck. 
gets dark at like 4 p.m. now. Finish work, I'm like, well, I guess I'm going to bed. I don't know. Number eight, forget a mask. The plague made a mark on humanity in the Middle Ages. Back then, they didn't wear a mask and social distance. When Europeans were hit with the Black Death in 1348, fleas carried by rats were mostly to blame. Around one third of the population was killed and it was easily contracted. One sneeze later and your lungs are filling up with liquid. Life expectancy in the late 14th century was 20 years old because of this thing. There was little to no knowledge about germs or how they were spreading, so you'd be in the middle of a literal plague. There'd be bodies lying everywhere, people were dumping their doo-doo at windows. Be like, oh, good evening, madam. And then you'd inhale and then. Number seven, get married. Love is in the air. In the dark ages, marriage was difficult to do. This was long before divorce lawyers came around to get every last drop of you. It was so easy that if you loved somebody, you would just announce that now you're married. Chris, we're married now. Isn't that crazy? That's how easy it was, boom. No need for a priest, big celebration, paperwork? Who has time for that? Nobody likes that. Sex before marriage, of course, was also a no-no. So if somebody just happened to wander into the wrong chamber and caught you doing the dirty, all you'd have to do is lie on the spot and say that you're married, and then be like, get out, weirdo. And they're like, ah, crap, they're married. We'll try again later. But more often than not, witnesses would be asked to be present when this marriage happened. Because the sad reality is that guys would often go through all this, get in bed, do the and then deny ever agreeing to the union in the next town when he's shacking up with somebody else. Horrible. Number six. Disturb the peace. When the Toronto Raptors won the NBA championships here, the place looked like Gotham City. Buses were flipped, there was garbage everywhere, people went nuts. Well, it's a good thing basketball wasn't around back in the Middle Ages because if you disturbed the peace in your local town, maybe you got too drunk, maybe you had an argument and got too loud, maybe there was even a scuffle in an alley, an old ha <laughs> one two. These situations that are common today usually end up with a slap on the wrist. They'll just send you in an Uber home or put you in the drunk tank. But do any of those things in the Middle Ages and you were locked up in the center of the town for an entire day. You'd be locked to the pillory while the town threw stuff at you and said horrible things. They would assault you verbally all day long in the sun. And depending how bad you were the night before and which town you upset, your punishment could be 30 minutes, it could be short and sweet, or it could be all day long and brutal. Both of these sound awful with a hangover happening at the same time. Hit that thumbs up and keep the peace. Huh? Number five, steal. While it's next to impossible to prove your marriage to somebody, it was also pretty tough to catch a thief. No alarms, no cameras, it was literally like Assassin's Creed. You would just throw your hood up, grab an apple, hide it, and then sprint into the woods for 30 minutes and be like, yes, I got away safely. The markup for stealing was also pretty insane for the time, but it made sense. If you stole something worth half a mark in Danish controlled parts of England, you would be fined 80 times whatever you stole. So you'd better be a track star. If you're still on that pie, you're like, I gotta go. This is, my family needs this. Each ruler had a different way of dealing with theft, so you may have gotten off lucky sometimes. Not trying to promote stealing here, but I'm talking about a time where people would risk their life to steal a loaf of bread for their family, you know? Not just like pickpocket a blackberry. But again, sometimes depending on where you got caught, you would lose an ear or you would lose a hand for stealing a cranberry. Anything over half a mark often resulted in death as a punishment. So run fast. Number four, blasphemy. When the Catholic Church was running the show during the Middle Ages, you better have been part of the God Squad or else you're gonna join them, apparently. Thomas Aquinas wrote about blasphemy in the Middle Ages saying that if we compare murder and blasphemy as regards to the object of those sins, it is clear that blasphemy, which is a sin committed directly against God, is more grave than murder, which is a sin against one's neighbor. On the other hand, if we compare them in respect of the harm wrought by them, murder is the graver sin, for murder does more harm to one's neighbor than blasphemy does to God. Yeah, that's, that's what you gotta deal with if you went back in time. Good, good luck, hope you're religious. If you spoke ill of the church and had beliefs of your own, God forbid, pun intended, that was one of the most wicked crimes to date. If you were charged with blasphemy, your tongue was removed with hot tongs or pliers. Awful. According to the Old Testament, other punishments would include stoning or hanging. All because you just, you said, I don't like him. I don't like that guy that does things. The way he's doing this, I'm hungry and I'm in pain and my family's dead. I don't know. Sorry. Blasphemy was common because you could accidentally do it, unlike stealing, you know? On my way to the studio today, I slipped on some ice, and let me tell you, if I was in the Middle Ages, I would have been charged twice before 9 a.m. Number three, live in the city. Okay, you may grow up wanting to live in the big city, eh? The Big Apple, the city that never sleeps. Whatever, whatever pulls you to the city, it would have been a lot different back then. Living in the city sucked. It was actually preferred to live in the countryside in the middle of nowhere. Like starving was better than this, really. If you were poor in the city, you had a short and nasty life. 
Cities were often built near rivers, but it didn't take long for said rivers to be full of sewage. Stinky water. I mentioned the plague earlier. Just like today, numbers pop in large cities, so if disease hit the town, it hit the town pretty hard. Just constantly wiping out these packed crowds over and over. And maybe you're a fan of the nightlife. Maybe you wish you were able to hit up these local medieval taverns, have a ye olde IPA, ale, whatever the hell. It wasn't even that fun. Curfews were strict, and if you were caught outside of that curfew, the odds of your drunk self getting robbed would be pretty high. Also, cities had public bathhouses too, which sounds nice, but again, during the Black Death, Maybe let's not take a dip today. Let's, let's just wait. wait. Let's just wait a week. Number two, wear stripes. On Wednesdays, we wear pink, but we never wear stripes. Medieval Europe, if you were caught wearing stripes, maybe you're trying to make a fashion statement, you could literally end up dead. There isn't a gang of mimes that will silently take you out if you wear their colors. No, stripes in medieval Europe was seen as the devil's clothing. There are accounts of real people getting arrested for wearing stripes. That's it. Where and when this began, it's hard to pinpoint, but in 1310, in the French town of Rouen, a cobbler was sentenced to death because he decided to wear stripes that day. It was a big deal though. It wasn't a law that changed depending on what town you're in. It was bigger than that. In 1295, Pope Boniface VIII banned religious orders from wearing any type of striped clothing. So it wasn't like, oh, this town's cool. We can wear stripes here. It's like, no, you're the devil. Bye. And finally, number one. Witchcraft. Whenever we think back to the Middle Ages, it's hard to forget that we once would accuse others of being a witch. It's like five plus five, I think that's 10. We're like, how did you know that? You're a witch, you're definitely a witch. They would accuse animals of witchcraft and mm, wizardry. No better sous chef than a golden retriever. Just mix it up some potions. To be fair, Airbud played like nine different sports, so I don't completely disagree on that thought. But cats? What's a cat doing? with a cauldron. On the official list of victims from the Salem witch trials, two cats were accused as well as two dogs. If their pet was behaving strangely, it must mean that they're working with witches in the middle of the night. Nothing to do with the poison rye, just all over the floor. It's for sure part-time witch. Villagers believe that witches traveled at night, not by broom, but by riding on the back of your furry friend. And it also wasn't just dogs or cats. They thought witches rode pigs, wolves, dogs, even turtles. Imagine a witch riding a turtle. I'd be like, I'm good, I'll beat you there. Even so, if you were convicted of being a witch, you had to confess. If you confessed to being a witch, your life was spared, and, and oddly enough, if you refused to confess, then you were executed. In the meantime though, being a witch and all, your head was being dunked in water, you were sleep deprived, these horrible torture methods were used until you were so broken that eventually you just admit to being a witch. You're like, fine, I, me and Airbud, we witch it up, happy, and then you're fine. If you were suspected of witchcraft, you also had to get naked in front of all these creeps while they looked for the devil's mark. The devil's mark being a birthmark or a mole or freckle, blemish on the skin, whatever. All signs of making deals with the devil, apparently. This thing would have, I would have gone to jail for sure for this one. I would have been dead for this, that's huge. Number 10, farming. In a world with a lack of food, not because I ate it all, which is honestly a good reason, peasantry had to work on their farms, not only to feed the rich, but also themselves. So if the men in your household are ill or sick, then that means it's rivet rosy time, or farming fran time, whatever you want to call it. I don't need to tell any farmer out there how tough their job can be. Being a medieval woman farmer, that's tough. Also, they probably weren't allowed to wear clothing that was more suitable for plowing fields. And of course, there's a woman trying to do a man's job. How dare she? People just should have let them be. There's a good chance the crops wouldn't make it either. A green thumb would have come in very handy. A tough job nonetheless. Number nine, beer maiden. This one goes out to any woman who's ever had the pleasure of working at a certain restaurant that's fixated on women's chests. You know the one I'm talking about. Or any woman who had the absolute pleasure of working at a golf course clubhouse. Keep your mitts to yourself, you filthy animals. I can't imagine the bar maidens of ye olde times had better luck. There really aren't a lot of laws to protect them either. But basically, they helped serve ale in the taverns and inns, which brought in all kinds of unsavory types. Mind you, it's not as bad as it would be in Skyrim or you know other fantasy RPGs, but it's still a sour bunch. Sometimes there were just barrels of ale and the maiden's job was to simply just keep filling the tankards and handing them out. I'm sure she was well respected and not even once ever had her personal space infringed upon, right? Of course not, no. Number eight, caring for children. Hey, someone had to do it. A woman's job is never done. At least that's what my mom, my aunt, uh, my grandma and pretty much every woman I've ever known has always said. Okay, sure, I was a little bit of a handful. I was loud and energetic and, and I loved to talk. Teachers always said I was a distraction in class. 
All right, maybe I was, and maybe I still am. Okay, I am. But at least the women caring for me had the modern amenities of the 21st century. A fridge full of fresh food, washing machines, cars, and a solid structure with four walls. So you can imagine if you had to deal with a kid like me back in ye olde times, just with none of the nice stuff that makes life today a lot of fun. Ye olde Chetty running amok. Oh, mother, mother. Number seven, the streets. Unusual to most, but very common to women of ye olde times. When you're a woman who's got nothing, sometimes you gotta give something. That something just so happens to be what's hiding in your pants. It's a profession that's as old as time, and it will not be going anywhere anytime soon. Women work the streets. I don't think that's anything to be ashamed of. Number six, Joan of Arc. It doesn't get more unusual than the savior of France. England and France were having a go at it if you will, which if you know history was like round 12 of 100. Anyway, it wasn't going too well for France, it was going rather poor actually. The same kind of poor I got on my report cards under the paying attention section. Oops. Then there was Joan, really a, a nobody, when one day she heard the voice from a higher power that she was to drive the English out of France. Naturally, the people around her, especially the men, scoffed at the thought of a young woman being the hero they needed. But given that they had nothing to lose, suited her up and sent her out. Plot twist, she did very well, like crazy good. The Battle of Orléans proving her grit. The English were so confused and disgruntled by a young peasant girl defeating their armies, they thought it was only proof of one thing, that she wasn't a sign of God, but rather a sign of the devil. How dare a woman beat us in, that's man stuff, you can't do that. Number five. Queen. It is unusual. Most people didn't get to be royal. I mean, think about it. Seriously. Although, I'd certainly like to be. I can't just imagine it. King of the internet. King of the black hoodie. Nice. Or king of the Chinese buffet. My point is that while women in medieval times didn't get the respect that they deserved, and every girl does, queens just had it better. And that's unusual. The queen might not have been as well respected as the king, but compared to the peasantry, she was fed. Had four walls around her that didn't leak or wind would you know, seep through or blow down, and wasn't working herself to the grave every day to provide for a king and queen that didn't think very much about them. That's a really hard life to live. Number four, cooking. Chief, somebody had to do it. Although, there's something that tells me the food wasn't that good. This isn't exactly Gordon Ramsay's five-star cuisine. Beans, cabbage, eggs, onions, bread, and of course, beer or ale to wash it down. The peasantry just didn't have the same access to food like royalty did. Although with a list like that, it sounds like it's a fast track way to an upset stomach or some really grody gas, dude. It was women who would often be preparing those delicious dishes. Besides the hours I would spend on the commode after visiting a commoner's house from eating that, the taste is something we're talking about, I think. When you guys are cooking chicken, for example, what are your favorite recipes, spices, flavors? Let us know in the comments, I'm curious. My favorite chicken is barbecue chicken, brushed with a little Diana sauce. Medieval folks just didn't have that. More upsetting than that is the lack of spices in general. While there were some, anything not local would have been crazy expensive and not available to common folks. Medieval women did the best with what they could when they had it. That's just how it goes, Chief. I talked to him. He's a chef. He said it's all right. Number three, nuns. It makes sense, honestly. Becoming a woman of God was honestly a good career choice for a woman. For starters, you become a woman of God, and that means you're protected under his vision. Thank you, Jeebus. And people need that back then. Seriously. Secondly, it would also give you a place to live. Some nuns stayed in one town and others traveled where needed. Staying in monasteries and convents where it was possible. And probably more comfortable than living in the mud and stone huts that the serf women were living in. And lastly, they got rulers and sticks. And if someone was bad, they would punish them when they misbehave. Oh, sorry sister, I didn't mean to say naughty words in the classroom. I guess you'll have to spank Chetty now, ooh. All jokes aside, this might have been one of the best things for a woman to be, besides royalty or marrying rich. It's just how the times went. Number two, landowner. I was shocked by this one too, honestly, but yes, women could own land. Sort of. It wasn't a blanket green light. It's a bit more confusing than that. Some could, some couldn't. There was a few rules here and there. They were stupid man patriarch poo poo rules, but rules nonetheless. In Normandy, for example, only men and their sons could possess land ownership. 
In the Basque region, both sons and daughters could inherit land. In England, both could, but if there were any surviving men or brothers, then they would be considered first, and not women at all sometimes. So, no, it's not as open as today, and you probably would catch some strange looks as a woman rolling up to an empty lot and staking your shovel in the ground. It makes life a lot easier if there aren't so many rules, and I know you guys agree with me at home. The less red tape, the better, right? And be nice to girls, be nice to women. Number one, artist. This one hits home. I think Chris can agree with me on this one. A lot of male artists, writers, and poets get remembered from history, but there was a few decent female ones too. We gotta give them some spotlight. Just It sucks that males get all the spotlight. To me, this makes sense. In my experience, a lot of girls I knew growing up had natural talent for arts. I remember growing up in school, and art class was always one of my worst subjects. No, not because I didn't follow directions, but my art never came out the way I wanted it to. I, I didn't feel the motivation, babe. I, didn't, I couldn't see the motivation. Most of the girls in art class just passed with flying colors. No pun intended. And for writing, well, besides my dyslexia, if you looked at a paper I wrote in the sixth grade versus a girl from my classroom in the sixth grade, what's the difference? Well, you can actually read hers. I, mine are terrible. All grade school antics aside, notable artists and writers include Clerica, Gouda, that's a cool name, and Hildegard of Bingen. Names you might not know, but for sure are worth a Google search. Kicking off the list at number 10, the big city. Okay, it's the 14th century, it's Saturday. You and the boys are off to have a hoot and or holler. You decide to hit the big city, check out one of those medieval taverns that everybody is talking about. So, what should you expect? Should you get your fake ID? Should you have your passport? Is there a bouncer? What's covered tonight? How many rupees is covered? Well, for starters, this is a long time before Ubers. So unless you have a horse or two, you're gonna have to walk quite a bit just to get to the bar. If the Black Death didn't get you, the commute into the city definitely would. Your knees would be clicking. Living in the city was horrible. Strict curfews were put into place. Violent crimes would happen all throughout the night because obviously back in those days, there's no police force out patrolling. Just shady dudes and hoods. Just Big Ched would be in the corner with his hood up, just planning something, you know what I mean? Number nine, house special. Many of these ale brewers were women, probably because men were too busy drinking it. Ale and bread were both necessities when it came to living in the late 12th century, because there's no Taco Bell anywhere. This food's sparse. Hunting, it's all sparse. I like saying the word sparse, it's nice. Sparse. Baking bread was not freely permitted, but making ale in your basement was. Yeah, we went from making ale in our living rooms to banning alcohol. History is wild sometimes. So the higher ups, these noble lords, they wouldn't care if you made ale and had a block party and all that jazz and made all that noise, but if you made weak ale, or if it was improperly measured and then distributed, then you would get a fine. Imagine that. That's like the police busting your house party, only when they get there, they turn the music up and congratulate you on a proper barrel of white claw. Uh, yes, black cherry, the finest. Number eight, don't mind the rats. Oh, what's that? You're with your friends and family gathering around a table, eating and drinking and conversing, having a lovely time? Ah, be a shame if hundreds of rats started to swarm your feet while you were mid-bite, wouldn't it? Welcome to the past. The plague rolled into town back in 1328 and it lasted until like 1350. It lasted a long time. It was actually horrible. We think of the plague in history and we're like, man, was that anything like the past few years? No, not at all. I haven't seen any swarms of rats lately. I haven't gotten the Black Death. The European population was reduced by one third and rats were mostly to blame. Yeah, these quick hairy balls of yuck just scurrying through the town. I don't want any part of that. I don't like rats. I actually do not like rats. These little guys passed it on. Mid-meal, you would feel a tickle, look down. Oh, it's just the plague. Nice, just a couple of plagues waiting for crumbs to fall. Oh, how cute is that? Yeah, just the bill, thanks. Number seven, BYOF. If you're passing by one of these middle-aged taverns, maybe you feel like grabbing some questionable lunch. Well, you better come prepared, my friend. Bring your own fork because we don't have any. We can't afford that. We're not blacksmith, we can't make a fork. What's a fork? We didn't have a moody server sitting in booth 11 doing roll-ups all night. This was the middle ages. If you had a fork, you took care of that fork. Forks don't grow on trees, pal. If you were lucky, these establishments would dish out a couple of spoons, maybe a couple of spoons, but forks? Nice joke, you're getting laughed at. You're watching everybody eat while you start. Historians compared sharing forks to sharing toothbrushes, so that's, in case you're wondering, no, you're not borrowing a friend's. Oh, after you've done that bike, can I just maybe, no, get out of here, see ya, off with your head. You also didn't have a steak knife handy ever. Knives were only reserved for carvers. Until the 17th century, all you had were little daggers. You would just poke and tear through your meal. You would just poke it. 
Number six, ins and outs. My favorite title. I've worked here for a year and a half now, it's my favorite title. When we think of a medieval tavern or an inn, it's important to note the differences. Yes, there's drinking. Yes, it smells like dad breath all throughout the air. But inns, their sole purpose was to house travelers comfortably. Whereas the tavern, not so much housing, more of rough housing, you know what I mean? Taverns were almost a private event thing. Your neighbors would whip up some ale, light a candle, two is a company, three is a crowd, come on in, now we got a basement tavern fight club, let's party. It was that easy, that was a tavern, you now have a tavern. No license, no nothing, just come on in, look what I made, drink it. Number five, license to pour. We got inns, we got taverns, so what else? Where can we get a pint in the 1500s? I am thirsty. Well, come the time of King Henry VII, these establishments were known as pubs. I know, I'm jumping ahead here a little bit, but this is the perfect time to talk about some early pub history. Why not, just squeeze it in. By 1577, there were over 17,000 alehouses, 3,000 inns, 500 taverns, all throughout Old England. So that's one pub for every 200 people. That is so much ale. That's, oh my gosh, do they work here too? This is a lot. So in order for this to take off, an act was passed in 1552. Innkeepers needed a license, so you can no longer throw a sleeping bag down, make some questionable wine in your cellar, and then call it an inn. That's not how it works, That's we're not doing that. We're not going to your basement and sleeping and drinking your ale. It's not gonna fly anymore. Show me some license. <laughs> Show me some licenses. -es. Number four, cherry brandy. Okay, it doesn't matter if you're a noble or a knight or whatever, everybody wants to go to the pub and loosen up. Especially a young Prince Charles. Back in the day, he would often visit the local Stornoway Harbor Village pub. So yeah, you would walk up, sit next to a prince and be like, hi, can I buy you a drink? What's going on here? He would often order from the bartender in a soft voice a cherry brandy. This prince was being discreet, but unfortunately a local reporter just happened to be sipping some crispy cold ones at the same time and overheard this guy getting his whistle wet. So now it was of course a huge scandal. A prince drinking, having fun? Number three, tavern history. Before the Middle Ages, there were still taverns. Places where alcohol was sold, of course, this goes back thousands of years. Taverns, believe it or not, existed during ancient Roman days. In ancient Greece, the Lesh, which was a fancy club, it served food to its members as well as strangers. So it was the first tavern, essentially. Ancient Greek taverns as well. Imagine making ale in flip-flops and like a little toga. I'd be so, I'd be dancing around. I'd be so light and just, nah, it wouldn't actually be horrible. It sounds like a horrible job. The Code of Hammurabi from ancient Babylonia, so around 1750 BCE, even all the way back then, they had the death penalty in place for those who improperly diluted beer. Imagine losing your head because you threw in too many hops. <laughs> like, ah, uh, oops. You see him take a sip, he's like, mmm. You're like, oh, please. Number two, drink ale responsibly. The night is beginning to wind down. There's a guy in a piccolo playing closing time in the corner. It's, you know, it's time to hit the road. We're feeling it. Stools are going up. We're, you know, some guy's wiping something off something. How dangerous are these drunken commutes at this point? Well, back in ye olden days, there wasn't a friendly server that made sure you had some water before calling you a cab. No, in the 14th century, ale was three gallons for a penny. Nobody was cutting you off. They're like, yep, keep going. Give us your pennies, sir. Ooh, down your throat. In 1276 in Elstow, a man named Osbert Le Whale came home from a local tavern just extremely intoxicated, not looking good. So much so that he fell and hit his head on one of the many stones around his house and then, well, Bob's your uncle. Yeah, get home safe. If you're gonna drink, do responsibly and get home completely safe. And finally, number one, the ride home. Like I just said, this was a lawless time. People would go to the tavern, slam tons of ale, and then just ride a horse home. Like it was, Fine? Yeah, not a great idea at all. This is drunk driving back in the day. More often than not, these guys would fall off or get lost or pass out on their horse and just end up in a different place. Imagine an unconscious knight strolling through a village at 6 a.m. You're like, that's Eric. That's literally Prince Eric. He's gone, he's asleep. In the early 1300s, it was pretty common for your husband to just not return at all. He would just leave the bar with the lantern, not see the well in front of him, trip, fall in, and drown. Like. You couldn't see anything, this was street lights back then. What a way to go out, horrible. There was one report of a man who was on his way home from the local tavern. He had to go to the washroom, break the seal, classic. So he decided to pull over and then go and relieve himself in the pond. But during so, he fell in and then drowned. Yeah, so back then it was just a bunch of drunk guys walking around uneven roads. So yeah, accidents are bound to happen. 
Guy's not even intoxicated. He's like, God, this road sucks. Number 10, property. It should be no surprise to anyone watching this today, but women's rights and the treatment of women was not everyone's priority in the medieval ages. Dudes were just mean. I'm sorry. Where did it all stem from? I'm not sure. I'm just a guy with blue eyes, and sometimes I say funny stuff. But what I do know is that women were treated more like men's property, which is that's that's that sucks. That's gross. No one likes that. Which they are not, thank you very much. Sometimes women were traded, like currency for livestock animals, land, and just business dealings in general, because women didn't have a say in the matter. Like, I'll give you two goats for my daughter. Here you go, dude. Which is just that's not a fair deal, dude. That's that's not a trade, man. Not a trade. Number nine, promising young woman. Remember when I said if I talk about medieval times, I was gonna bring this up? It's a classic, a medieval staple. Couldn't couldn't talk about medieval times without it, really. What am I getting at? Well, that's marrying a woman in her midlife, about about 12 years old. Yeah, I know. It's gross. Deplorable, despicable, naughty, and just unsavory. Okay, so people only lived to their mid 30s and 40s back then, so time is of the essence. Sure, I get it, but come on, man. I am hereby banning any cradle robbing or diaper sniping. That includes the dudes who out of high school and they're dating a woman still in high school. I'm banning it, that's it. Chetty says no. Number eight, bedroom watch party. Okay, let me paint the scene for you. It's 2009, you just finished pre-drinking and watching the latest episode of Jersey Shore with your friends. There's enough hair product in your hair to keep a bowl of lime jello still. You slap on some Uggs and head to the club. You meet someone who's cute AF. Maybe it's the tequila, maybe it's the apple bottom jeans, but you wanna come home with this person. Instead of making it to your bedroom, a bathroom nightclub is now your domain for love. People walk by and witness your actions. But you do not care because this is your life and it's 2009 and you can do whatever you want. Okay, so that, but medieval times. Yeah, it's not a nightclub, but people would just come into your bedroom to witness that you went through with it on the marriage. Nobody wants that. That's just weird. That's not normal. Come on in. Me and my wife are about to... Come on in. Number seven. The Hunger Games. In the not so common case of a woman trying to divorce her husband because, you know, she's most likely not being treated very well and she's just not allowed to divorce and it's really just a messy time for women. How do you lose a woman? You forget to cherish her. Or you fight in combat to determine who wins the divorce. And by winning the divorce, I mean whoever wins lives. Yes. This was something that was actually done in medieval Germany. Basically, there's a little arena. Husband gets put into a hole to make it fair, I guess. There's a sack of rocks and a club, and then you just full send it and start swinging at each other. I feel like most divorces suck. Not that I would know, I've never been married, but I mean, come on, are the married people really telling me at home right now that they wanna swing rocks and clubs at each other? I don't think so. Number six, gross. Kangas Khan, maybe the most down bad dude to ever get on a horse and do what he did. Well, maybe except Arthur Morgan, but he's not real, even though I wish that chiseled, handsome, rugged man was. <sighs> Despite my daydreaming fantasies, I'm here to talk about a really bad dude, Kangas Khan, medieval conqueror and womanizer. He had so many wives, who a good portion of which were forced at sword point to be his wife, and husband and wives were not exactly sitting around the couch uh, watching news together back then. They, they did the deed. Whether or not both partners signed off on it. What I'm getting at is he had so many offspring that his DNA is still with us today. 0.5% of the male population on earth are descendants of the Mongol warrior. That's over 60 million dudes. That's just insane, bro. Number five, the Moss. I am gonna come in here and tell you I know what it's like to be a woman or pretend I understand. There's been lots of great photos of humans that have been taken throughout history, but one that we miss for sure is when I was a kid and I learned what happens to women on those special couple days of every month. Not shock, just confusion. The look on my face, it was it was priceless. I wish I wish y'all could have seen it. We got things mostly figured out now though, but think about the past. Medieval times, not an understanding time for ladies. There were just no products to help in that scenario. So, have you ever wondered what they did? I did, weird thing to think I guess, but oh well. Moss pads, yeah. Take some moss, you wrap it up in a cloth, bada bing, bada boom, now you're in business. Which actually is really smart when you think about it. I never would have thought of that, but that's, I'm a dude, so I, would, I wouldn't think about that. I just don't, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't think about those big thinking thoughts and things sometimes. I'm just a big dumb guy. Number four, witch hunt. This is also a time where if a woman speaks out of line, 
or does something to upset the feng shui of things, there's a good chance she will get labeled a witch and burned at the stake. This was becoming an issue because, well, it was becoming a witch hunt, meaning anything that was slightly not cool or basically anything people feared or disliked could be labeled witchcraft, and thus likely an innocent woman would be burned at the stake. I mean, it sounds like they had it down to a science, really. Woman does something crazy, will bring out the charcoal briquette, no, no, see that's that's not right. It's not like they could have done this amazing thing called investigate, you know, see if the woman was actually innocent or the claim that she was a witch because she wants to be paid a fair wage like a man. Mm, that doesn't really sound like witchcraft to me. Maybe don't be so hasty to bust out the pitch and torches. That's all. That's all I'm saying. Number three, you gotta do what you gotta do. I know what it's like to be down on your luck. Trust me, it sucks. It's not fun. But you budget, save, and work hard. You'll be back in the black before you know it. Women of medieval times got up and went to work. The kind of work a lot of women were forced to do because of circumstances. The oldest profession in the book, selling booty. It's been happening since day one and it won't be going anywhere soon. Now, I'm not here to condemn that kind of work. And funny enough, in medieval times, it was considered to be an actual profession. I just feel if you're gonna be in that line of work, it should be your choice. I'm a Las Vegas kind of guy. I love gambling, boozing, and the freedom to do what you want after strolling out of a casino after too much drinking and gambling. If you know what I mean. Sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do to make the bread, and they just had to do what they had to do. And that's it. Number two, Hell Hath No Fury. Princess Olga of Kiev was a prime example of Hell Hath No Fury like a woman scorned. Long story short, her husband was torn apart by trees. Some gruesome stuff. It was actually, if you look at it, it's, it's, not, it's not nice. So like the Sith on its worst behavior, she plotted her revenge. When 20 men she deemed were all responsible for her husband's passing were coming into town, she had a large ditch dug where they were buried alive. That is that is so heinous, I, I can't even. She then extended a welcome to more of the men responsible. When they arrived, she invited them to wash up in her bathhouse, where she had the doors locked and the place torched, like it was a witch hunt or something. Just had them cooked, just threw, just cooked them up. Just, but I mean, they, they burn women, so why not? Why not cook some dudes? Uh, okay. Number one, honestly. Who throws a shoe? If you've ever been to a wedding, then you've probably seen the bride throw a bouquet of flowers to waiting bridesmaids and other lucky ladies. Because the lady who catches the flowers is the next woman to be swept off her feet and to be married. Put a ring on it. Kind of ending on a wholesome note here, which is kind of nice, but it's still a, a little messed up. Hear me out. In medieval times, it wasn't flowers. It was shoes. At first, it doesn't seem so bad, right? Shoes. We'll throw some shoes around. Why not? Besides, you know, the, the shoe being thrown too hard, you wouldn't want to catch a loaf or on the side of the head, that, that would hurt. I think we forget how filthy our shoes can be. I mean, they walk through everything, dirt, mud, blood, and if you're in medieval times, having a good old fashioned wedding in the village probably meant some manure. Eek. Well, I'm all about tradition, but maybe we could throw the flowers instead. They just smell better, and you know, there's just, there's less poop. Kicking off our list at number 10, the London Tornado. We've all heard about the Great Fire of London in 1666. So let's talk about another horrible event from history, shall we? That's why I'm here after all. On October 16th, 1091, harsh winds from the Southwest took out more than 600 houses and a handful of churches. There was a mighty tornado. The Church of St. Mary was a rather unholy place to be on that specific day. The tornado killed two men in this building and it tore up the roof and timbers went everywhere. The rafters were actually ripped from the structure, then slammed down far away back into the earth. Turns out historically about half of these rafters were buried in the dirt. That's how much force was thrashing them about. Tornadoes are so scary. I feel a strong wind outside and I'm immediately back inside. That's it, I'm shaking in my boots. I don't mess with wind. Number nine, the great drowning of men. Such a tragic name, my lord. How about we take out the word great and all these references maybe, I don't know, it's kind of horrible. In the middle ages, coastal areas around the North Sea were hot spots for flooding. Now historically, there were numerous reports of flooding here and for some reason, between the 11th and 15th centuries, this area would get absolutely destroyed. It would get completely swamped. And it's even larger than you can possibly imagine. 
The St. Marcellus flood took place on January 16th, 1362. Now the death toll here, I mean obviously it's impossible to tell for sure, but historians believe it was at least 25,000 people. That's horrible. Atlantic gales were to blame for the rush of water because this event also goes hand in hand with the great wind of 1362. The great wind, awesome. The mighty wind, like it's not great at all. It's not really good. Number eight, one name. This next one here blows my mind. I never really thought about this before, but what was it like before we had surnames? Surnames were introduced to us in England in 1066, but before then, well, you were just Greg, period. That's it. There was another Greg, well, that was it. Now you guys had to fight till the death. No, I'm just kidding. At first, surnames were a little bit different. They were descriptions, almost, about the person you were meeting. So you'd meet a guy and he would say, hey, I'm Greg Red. Red signified his red hair. Makes sense. Greg Red, Greg Gray, he's getting a little old. Got it, Gregs, we're good. But the best part, your name could actually change over time because your description and then your appearance would also change. So one day you would meet Greg Red, but eventually his hair would fall out, he would age, then get stressed because, you know, he's living in the medieval times and all. And then once that happens, your name would change to match your new description. Now you're Greg Ball. Ball back then meant bald in Middle English, so everyone had the last name Ball. Isn't that amazing? Next video, I'll be Taylor Ball. I'll just be bald. Why not? Just change it up like Heisenberg. Number seven, medieval meals. Ah, yes. I hope you're eating while you're watching this. If so, give it a thumbs up, take a big bite, and good luck. Seeing as the holidays just passed, I figured there's no better time to mention a medieval holiday tradition. I'm glad we don't do this one anymore. This one's pretty gross. Swans today, they're beautiful. We see them traveling in pairs, and we don't hunt them down because, well, that would be insane, right? Medieval days, swans were hot property. They were a delicacy of the upper classes. Christmas swan pie. Nice. Here you go. For you and yours. Enjoy. Merry Christmas. I would be crying on Christmas Day if I saw this on the table. They would actually stuff swans with beef, which I personally don't recommend. Turkeys, I'm like, okay, that we've dealt with. Swans, I'm like, no. But they're in love. They mate for life. Do we eat both? Let's eat both, I guess. Other medieval meals included peacocks, cranes, turtle doves, sparrows, and herons. Herons? Imagine Christmas dinner is a heron lying on the table. You're like, Really, Dad? I don't really want to eat this. This is a long, it's a long neck. Number six, the dancing plague. Okay, summer 1518, a summer we will never forget, sadly. One of the most bizarre events in medieval history, the dancing plague. The town of Strasbourg was calm, cool, and or collect until out of nowhere, one woman began to dance dance uncontrollably in the streets. She was convulsing, it was wild, but then soon others joined in and eventually there were over 400 people dancing their days away. Now it sounds funny in some degree, but it's really tragic. This was not a good time at all. A great amount lost their lives due to pure exhaustion and heart attacks and the authorities tried their best to help the situation so they paid for musicians to perform for them while they danced, while they were convulsing. They're like, oh yes, bring in a jazz band. Let's complete this image. This happened a few times in Europe, not just once. Between the 14th and the 17th centuries, we still don't know what exactly happened, but there were dance plagues. So it was a common occurrence. All we know is that it was some sort of illness. It was not like step up. It wasn't a fun thing like step up at all. No one's just popping and locking in the streets. They're like, hey, nice. Let's bring in some music. This is great. No, people were very sick. They were very ill. Number five, Shroud of Turin. They say art is subjective, but what does the Shroud of Turin really show us here? Is it JC? Is it Jesus Christ himself? Many believe the cloth shows an image of Jesus when he was crucified. And once you see it, it's hard to argue otherwise. Hard to get out of your mind. Radio carbon tests do date the cloth back to around 1260, and recent studies suggest that shroud was used in medieval church plays that would depict this exact scene, the resurrection of one Jesus Christ. What do you think? Accurate representation or another case of face pareidolia? Face pareidolia is when you see Jesus and things. I look at our producer Chris, I see Jesus every day right there. A little bit more Jack than Jesus, but you know, same image, more or less. Number four, summer is canceled. Back in 2013, scientists discovered a volcano on Lombok Island in Indonesia that went off sometime around May to October 1257. And scientists all agree that this eruption was the largest blast that the Earth had seen in 7,000 years. So it was quite a spectacle, a horrible spectacle. If that cut to the next year, 1258, the following cold temperatures ruined crops and brought famine to pretty much all of Europe. Cattle were all dying off quickly. It was far too cold for them to even stand a chance. And it's estimated that London saw 15,000 deaths that year alone. Experts believe that this volcanic eruption was a factor in the Little Ice Age that changed global temperatures from the 14th to 19th century. That's like if Yellowstone went off tomorrow. It would be a really bad time, and then well, afterwards would be almost worse, if anything. No resorts for a while, I think. 
Definitely not. Number three, the Great Famine. The medieval adjective game, back again with the Great Famine. Awesome, another great. All of Northern Europe suffered the Great Famine in 1315, so only like 60 years after that volcano went off. I mean like, what luck is that? What a terrible time to be alive. 1315 to 1317, two years of famine, countless lives were lost, and of course, with people losing hope, crime rate shot up to an extreme level. Can't even describe some of the things that were recorded, but my God, people were horribly insane. The Great Famine brought unrest in peasants, but it also disturbed members of nobility. It's always nice when that happens, right? It's not all of us suffering. Some of these noble purple lords up here also starving. Cool, we're even. They were set back and in turn, they gave up the oath of chivalry. Now talk about the dark ages. They're like, eh, you know what? No. Number two, plague bear. Bus boys, but for bodies. Let's do it. My God, this one's really dark. The hot summer of July 1665, right before London saw that great fire. What to do with all these poor souls who have been hit by the plague? Now bodies at this point were literally starting to pile up. So we need a new profession, somebody that deals specifically with these horribly infected bodies. Any volunteers, show of hands? Yep, we got one. Like a plague bear, for example. There we go, just what we need. A plague bear has your back and your front and all of your infected places. Church wardens would organize burials. This was a normal thing back in the 1600s, but when the plague hit, they had to change things up. If somebody had the plague, well, these plague bears, they, these brave souls, they would step up. They were the ones responsible for transporting all these bodies far, far, away, and then they would bury them, right? Just way over there. Great idea, honestly, the further the better. Couldn't agree more. A church would house these plagued souls away from society. Now, it sounds sad, but this was the best call, all things considered. So no, you weren't visiting any of your deceased loved ones anytime soon. And finally, number one, medieval punishment cleaner. This one really sucks. Best for last, here we go. Back in medieval times, many executions were public. The town would come out, watch a hanging or two, and then grab some bread and then head home. They're like, hey, classic Sunday. This was normal back in medieval days. Medieval punishments were like an event, but like modern events, somebody has to stick around and clean the place up. One of the earliest documented executioners goes back to 1202. He was the OG headsman. His name was Nicholas Johann, and their nickname was The Justice. The Justice. Are you kidding me? My palms are already sweating. Are you sure it wasn't the mountain? My God. Afterwards, this position spread through many capitals and large towns of Western Europe. And with them came the execution cleaners. Yeah, just a squeegee and a spray bottle. They're like, hey, which table boss? Let's do this. Over his 36 years of ruling, King Henry VIII executed roughly 57,000 people. Yeah, welcome to the Middle Ages. Hope you like mopping. You're gonna be doing it a lot, like a lot, a lot. At number 10, bloodletting. Back in the medieval age, medicine just wasn't the greatest. I mean, they had a plague that wiped out 50% of the population in Europe and even their quote-unquote doctors were overlapping jobs. Barbers were cutting hair, obviously, but they were also setting broken bones and bandaging wounds, and I'm not sure I would really trust that, but back then it was a case of you get what you get. So I guess people weren't complaining all that much about their barber Joey from down the street giving them a cast, you know? But other than the practice of patching wounds and whatnot, they were also practicing bloodletting back then, and it was a little much. Bloodletting was a practice of withdrawing blood in order to cure or prevent diseases or illnesses, so doctors would use things like leeches to suck blood out of their patients, but they also used scarification methods to scrape away the skin to drain the blood, and others used lancets to slice open veins, sometimes including the jugular vein. I'm so glad that we don't do this anymore because frankly, I would like my blood to stay inside of my body. Thank you. At number nine, the king's evil. Being a king or queen in the medieval ages might seem like a cool job, but I don't really think it was. With the rivalries that these people had, they were at risk of being assassinated in one way or another. They had to worry about their bloodlines and of course, that thing that everyone had to deal with, illness. Some kings, to help out their people, were tasked with healing an illness called the king's evil, and you're probably thinking, well, these kings aren't doctors, how did they cure illnesses? And to that I say, well, they touched it, of course. This whole thing started in the 11th century, when Edward the Confessor became known for touching a person that was suffering from scrofula, aka the king's evil, and curing them. People thought that this was a miracle, and so for hundreds of years after that, English and French monarchs were tasked with touching the sick to cure them of this illness, because monarchs were believed to be an incarnation of the divine. Before we carry on talking about some of the bizarre medical practices from the medieval age, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Toothworms. 
If you're one of those people who really hate going to the dentist, just be glad that you didn't have to go to the dentist during the medieval ages because that was an absolute nightmare and a half. Not only because they had no proper medicine or anesthetics, but because you could also get the worst diagnosis you could ever get, a diagnosis of an infection of toothworms. They believed that people could be infected with toothworms that caused a tooth decay and pits and holes in the tooth were home to a worm that looked like a tiny eel. What's worse than the diagnosis, however, was the removal process. They didn't want to pull out the tooth that was supposedly infected with these tiny worms, so instead they used a more holistic approach. A method that they would use to get rid of the worm would be to take a candle that was made of sheep's fat and various seeds, and they would hold it as close to the tooth as possible so that the worm would run out from heat and fall into a little dish of water that was being held beneath the person's mouth. That sounds like a horrible trip to the dentist, that's for sure. At number seven, pee reading. Now this might not be considered a surgery, but this medieval age tradition was probably one of the strangest medical practices I have ever heard. In medieval England, people were known to get diagnosed based on their pee. Back then, they believed that the consistency, color, and taste of someone's pee could diagnose someone's ailments. They took this method of diagnosis so seriously that they published books for the wealthy so that they could do this practice at home, and these books included illustrations and color charts so that they knew how to judge their own pee. According to their text, if your pee was white, then it was the ideal color, and that meant that everything was working just fine. If it was wine colored like blue or black, then that meant that something was very wrong. And if it was green, then you were basically on your last leg and you should probably get your will in order. Now, I'm not sure how accurate these readings actually were since medicine was basically non-existent back then, but they tried their best with what they had, I guess. However, I'm pretty sure you don't need a book to tell you that if your pee is wine colored, that's a bad thing. At number six, eye surgery. Our eyes are very sensitive, which is why it's so important to keep them healthy. Oftentimes when something is wrong with our eyes, we naturally go and get them fixed. But back in the medieval age, if something was wrong with your eyes, you really had to think long and hard about whether or not you really wanted to get them fixed because the procedure to fix your eyes sounded like an absolute nightmare. Back then when someone had cataracts, a surgical procedure called needling was performed and it involved having a doctor push a thick black needle into the patient's cornea. Remember, there was no anesthesia back then, so you were just raw dogging this entire experience. After the procedure was completed, the patient would usually be left with an unfocused eye, described to be similar to a camera without a lens. That didn't necessarily matter to everyone, because while it would be hard to read the Bible, it would still be okay to plow a field, and as long as they could work, that's really all that mattered. At number five, kidney stones. Now I can't say that I'm all that familiar with the way that kidney stones are treated these days, but I would assume that it is very different and not as terrifying as how they were treated back in the medieval age. After learning about this, I'm convinced that this could double as a form of torture. Basically how it went down is a physician's assistant would be sitting on top of you while you had your legs strapped to your neck. And then as the assistant was holding you, the doctor would stick two of his fingies up your little booty hole, press his fist against your pubes until he felt a hard pellet indicating a stone. After the diagnosis, then it would be removed through the bladder using a sharp instrument. Now I've never had a kidney stone, so I don't know how painful it is to have one, but for those who have experienced this, would you rather go through this medieval procedure or just tough it out until you pass the stone yourself? At number four, butt stuff. Even back in the medieval age, they had treatments for hemorrhoids. This illness was often associated with St. Fiaker, also referred to as the quote, patron of hemorrhoids. A 7th century tale said that this monk cured his illness by sitting on a sacred rock for several hours, and so in the medieval age, some physicians believed that the same method could apply to other people's butts. Obviously, that didn't work, so some other superstitious physicians came up with an alternate and more nightmare-inducing way of getting rid of hemorrhoids. If you didn't want to sit on a sacred rock for an extended period of time, you could always get a red-hot iron tube put up your butt. Yeah, I don't think it gets any worse than that. At number three, belladonna. Belladonna, deadly nightshade, whatever you want to call it, doesn't make it any less poisonous. This plant is one of the most toxic plants around, but that doesn't mean that people haven't tried to use it in their personal use. Normally, we want to stay away from toxic things like chemicals and X's, but back in the days of old, people said full scent and used belladonna as eye drops. Yeah, 
That's right. Even though this is literally poisonous, they thought, hmm, let's put it in our eyeballs. The organs that we use to see, because that's a bright idea, right? Many people, mostly women, used eye drops made out of deadly nightshade because it changed the size of their pupils to make them look more starry-eyed, and that was seen as a beauty trend. In moderation, these eye drops wouldn't really cause too much damage, but prolonged use of the poison could see some serious health concerns like stiff muscles, short-term memory loss, confusion, disorientation, and in some cases, death, because it could literally paralyze your heart. And if you're thinking, man, I'm so glad we don't do that anymore, then think again, baby, because if you've ever been to the optometrist and you've had your pupils dilated, guess what they use? That's right. Belladonna. It's not harmful to put just a couple drops in your eyes and not to do it again for a while, but if you get your hands on it and start using it too much and in high dosage, then you're in for some trouble. At number two, trepanation. Trepanation is the process of drilling or scraping a hole into the human skull. Yeah, I know, that doesn't really sound like fun in the slightest, but back in the olden days, people did it, and it was a relatively common body modification for some reason. This practice was done in all sorts of cultures throughout different periods of time. During the medieval ages into the Renaissance, trepanation was used to treat epilepsy and mental disorders. This practice also dates as far back as the Paleolithic period. In ancient Peru, trepanation was done using a ceremonial knife called a tumi. In ancient Greece, it was done using a drill. Polynesians used sharpened seashells shells, and in Europe, the procedure was done using sharp flint or obsidian. Though we know that in the medieval times and the Renaissance, trepanation was considered a medical practice, in ancient times, the reason for this practice is still uncertain. It could have been to try and fix damage from a head trauma, but it's also believed that this practice was done to heal mental problems, release toxic spirits, or even as some kind of ritual. And finally, at number one, knife hand. Now this one is by far the craziest medieval surgery in my opinion. So you know Captain Hook, right? Just got a hook for a hand. Well, this guy I'm gonna tell you about has Captain Hook beat by a landslide. A 6th century medieval burial was found in Italy and it revealed a male warrior who had a knife for a hand. Yeah, this man had a knife instead of a hand. This warrior had his hand amputated, however the reason for said amputation is unknown. In place of the lost hand, the prosthesis was a blade. Now I don't know if this guy lost his hand in battle or something and they just gave him the best that they could and that was a knife as a placeholder, or if he just willingly chopped off his hand so that he could have a knife hand. But either way, that is so badass and I would have loved to see this guy in battle. Kicking off our list at number 10, rat poison. Yeah, this one's pretty uh, pretty gross right off the hop. During the 16th century, it was common to fill your house with arsenic trioxide to keep rats from your food supply, right? You don't want those guys hanging around. They're bringing the plague in, a little nasty. Barbara Gilbert of Leicestershire, she thought that she was grabbing flour and ended up mixing this stuff with milk. That was a really bad mistake. She thought she was preparing a meal for her family when really she was about to poison them. Now, it's horrible to say, but Barbara, she took a sip, thankfully, before her family, and then she was thankfully the only person who lost their life because of this, you know, poison that they made. It's tragic, but it could have been much, much worse. Everyone dying because of a rat poison plague? That's pretty horrible. But it happened again in 1599 when Margaret Moreland thought she was giving her husband ale. Really, it was arsenic trioxide and water, aka not ale. God, that would really suck. What a horrible mishap. Number nine, famine. Back in medieval times, food supplies solely relied on good weather and proper harvests. And obviously, lack of rats definitely helps. If the seasons were dry, people of course starved. More often than not, common folk would survive on rations of berries, corn, and wheat. Now, the lack of food, of course, led to disease. Now, they didn't starve to death. Illnesses like tuberculosis, smallpox, typhoid, influenza, and mumps often did the trick. The Great Famine of the early 14th century was historically awful. Between 1315 and 1322, it rained for 150 days at a time. That's, uh, that's a lot of water. Western Europe was a mess. These conditions took the lives of 15% of England. Farmers couldn't plant or harvest crops, and the winters during these years were historically bad as well. Insane rainfalls and severe freezing. We're still struggling to adapt to weather changes today, but imagine the dark ages. Weather sucked every day. It was horrible. Number eight weather witch. Aside from that little ice age I just referenced, what was the weather like for most of these medieval travelers? Five seasons of Game of Thrones. They talked about winter coming, but what were those winters really like? People in the 1400s believed that bad weather could be caused by the behavior of wicked people, like killers, those who sin, incest, that was a pretty bad one. Game of Thrones would have been screwed off the hop. That would have been a lot of horrible weather. Even family arguments were to blame. You talk back to your mom, next thing you know, the crops are frozen. 
Nice, way to go, Eric. It's on you. Now this eventually linked back to blaming witches or sorcerers who some believe could control the crops and or weather. Yeah, sorcerers controlling your crops, imagine that. The Malleus Maleficarum, published in 1486, this book straight up references a witch that would fly in the air and create storms. Yeah, with effects that took lives of animals and farmers. No thanks, I'm glad we don't have any of those floating about. We just have drones now, which are just as annoying. Number seven, Jesus take the wheel. With witches to blame for hailstorms, who do we turn to to fight the powers of evil, right? How do we get some goddamn crops back in the game? From the 14th to the 16th century, the ice pack grew around the world. Weather was changing in a drastic way, and by 1550, there had been an expansion of glaciers worldwide. Everyone thought that it was witches causing it. It's like, no, just plain old science. Back then, the general public didn't know what was happening. They didn't have Neil deGrasse Tyson explaining the phenomenon on a podcast. So people in the medieval times would perform rituals for harvesting crops in hopes that something would change. There would be special prayers, charms, beautiful services, all to ensure proper weather and fertility of the fields. Certain saints, like historical saints, they were believed to protect against harsh conditions. To protect us from the frost, we had Saint Surveys, and to shield us from the winds, we had Saint Clement. And to fight back against drought and the rains, we had the one and only Saint Elijah, or Elijah. The power of the saints and the Virgin Mary were believed to protect against storms and lightning. So that's like the medieval version of the Avengers, I guess. Tis the season. Thank you, Saint Mary. Let's keep it dry. Canada has a huge storm coming tonight, so could use some of that saint power ASAP. Number six, violence. Imagine going outside in medieval times. Is it dangerous? Is it lonely? Is it full of criminals? What's it like? What were those odds like just to get home? Street violence and brawls and taverns were as common as they are today. And like we saw a few times in Game of Thrones, peasants got a bit fed up from time to time. Yeah, I can't imagine why, huh? Vassals would revolt against their lords. This happened historically a few times. The rebellion of peasants in Flanders, this went down in 1323, and then 60 years Years later, England saw the peasants revolt in 1381. A lot of peasants getting fed up. Yeah, I, I would assume. I'm surprised it took that long, really. Number five, pole vaulting. The day pole vaulting was born was December 25th, 1521. It was a Christmas miracle, some would say. A laborer named Robert Baker, he was heading home from the church after a Christmas gathering. Severe floods interrupted his normal commute home, classic medieval flash floods. So Robert Baker, the quick thinker that he is, he grabbed a tall pole and he just, he just vaulted his way over this new stream that had appeared. And then he then continued home. He just carried the stick home and he was like, what have I done? What have I invented? Now, Bumblebee, we don't recommend this as a commute. Don't pole vault over things in general, unless you're a professional, don't do that. Because later on, when attempting that same stunt, Baker's pole snapped mid-leap and he ended up drowning. Yeah, the poor guy bridged the Terabithia to himself. You don't want anything to happen like that. That's, that's really bad. Again, in 1540, a similar case. Somebody tried to leap over a pond, but the pole wasn't strong enough and it broke and they drowned. Do you pull vault? If so, comment down below how scary it is to learn because I'm interested. I don't know. Number four, falling bacon. If they ever made a Final Destination movie that takes place in medieval times, that'd be an odd pitch. This would be the opening scene for sure. This is crazy. Not sure how true this is, but if so, Oh boy, my palms are sweating. It was February 12th, 1543, and Elizabeth Brown was working as a servant in the household of a man named Hugh Talmash. Now this was over in Huntingdon. Things were going swimmingly, I guess, until a tragic accident occurred. Elizabeth was the victim of a freak accident while sitting by the kitchen fire. A massive, unsliced chunk of bacon was suspended in the chimney above her to smoke over time. And that day, the rope decided to just go. And then said bacon ended up crushing her. Now, if you're smoking meats, don't put it above or near you. That's a, that's a bizarre way to smoke meat. And also, if you're smoking meat, must be nice. That's a crazy charcuterie board. Number three, outhouse troubles. This next one really stinks, my gosh. If you're eating food right now watching this, maybe skip to number two. I won't take it personally. Here we go. On June 2nd, 1523, a Cambridge baker named George Duncan went out to his back garden to use the medieval outhouse, AKA the cesspit. Now today they're built a little differently, but back in the day it was a massive hole with a wooden rim. It wasn't pretty, it didn't smell great, it was horrible, it was made you sick. Now Duncan, the poor lad, rumor has it, he was a little intoxicated, and Duncan, while doing his business, fell into said cesspit, leading him to suffocate to death in the worst way imaginable. Now, it sounds like a crazy way to go in medieval times, but it can happen today as well. Because in 2014, two people lost their lives trying to recover a cell phone that fell into a porta potty. Yeah, imagine that. Losing consciousness and feces is a dangerous place to do it. That's very. 
horrible. That's a horrible way to go out. That's the worst way to go, I think. That's the worst. Number two, clocks. Yeah, if you think a piano falling on your head is insane odds, now imagine a clock. Welcome to the medieval times. The 16th century saw the beginning of clock making, and early on, these things, they were units. They were massive. Great, great grandfather clocks, these early mechanical pieces, they were made of metal and were chock full of machinery. Weight equals danger. And in 1513, a man named John Townsend was holding an iron clock, very proud, when all of a sudden it slipped from his hand and it hit the young man right next to him. William Brett, it hit him right in the forehead, and the next day, Brett died of his injuries. The guy died because he got hit with a clock. What a way to go. And finally, number one, horse racing. I think it's general knowledge at this point, but standing near a racehorse equals not a good idea. Right, you heard it here first on Bumblebee. January 16th, 1540, two riders named Henry Headlam and Brian Newton, they were racing back and forth along a wall in a garden right outside of London. Casual medieval time stuff, just racing horses. Now, Newton's horse was going quite fast and Newton didn't realize that he was approaching an elm tree. Now, his head hit a branch from the tree and he broke his neck and died the next day. Now, right after this first tragic death, racing was seen as a danger to spectators and riders. More than fair. Riding a live animal at top speed yeah, that's obviously a little bit dangerous, I would assume. But then in 1534, Jane Jones was just watching, not even riding, she was watching horse racing, and then out of nowhere, a horse trampled her. Yeah, four days later, her injuries got the best of her. So if you're watching any live horse racing this afternoon, I don't know, have some distance maybe. Move up a couple of seats in the stands. Horse racing is big in uh, Ontario for some reason. I don't know, we have like one big one, constantly busy. Number 10, Andrew, is, uh, is this you? What? There is no lighter way to put this. We talked about a court jester or a fool, but did you know that some medieval royal courts had professional farters? Yes, that's people whose sole purpose in life was to fart. I'm still trying to figure out how Andrew can fart on command, but these guys did it as a job. These guys would fart their way to being rewarded with houses and lands for their fartscapades. Fartscapades that would include passing their intestinal wind in unique, creative, musical, or amusing ways. <laughs> I wonder, if, I wonder if the mic picked that up. This quote I found from St. Augustine in City of God says, these talented individuals had, quote unquote, such a command of their bowels that they can break wind continuously at will so as to produce the effect of singing. The most famous of the medieval flatulists, no, that's not a joke, that's actually what they're called, was Roland the Farter from Hemingstone Manor in the county of Suffolk, England. In the 12th century, who could shoot water up to five feet? He could squirt water out of his bum. Well farting. Ready? Get some water. <laughs> <laughs> Number nine, arrange marriages. Today, the marriage industry makes millions every year. Flowers, design, and of course, the bridal dresses. It's a good business, especially once the weather starts to warm up. You got options today, ladies. Sleeves or no sleeves, veil or no veil, and thousands of other dress designs that I simply just don't understand. But the beauty of it all is that you get to marry the man of your dreams. Hi. <laughs> I'm not the man of their dreams, let's be honest. <laughs> or at least the best smelling one in your social circle. Definitely not me. However, for the ladies of the past, they sometimes didn't get to pick their man as her family or royal court would. A lot of marriages, especially on the high ups, were often more of a political move than that of a romantic one. Sure, marrying for an alliance sounds cool, but man, dinner time would be like a blind date every night. That's, that's just super awkward. So like, uh, like where are you from? What's going on? Yeah. Number eight, keys to the city. You know when people say that someone got the keys to the city as a way of saying that person can do whatever they want? Well, that came from the medieval times. You see, back in ye olden times, if you lived in a walled city when nighttime hit, they locked those gates up tight. Don't want some slimy bandits, enemy soldiers, or unwanted flatulists coming and going in the city in the dead of the night. Someone who was particularly well liked or who had done something noteworthy to gain the respect, trust, and admiration of the people would be given a key to the city, giving them the free reign to come and go as they please. We actually still do this, but obviously most cities don't really have walls anymore, so it's more of a symbolic thing like, hey, you're great, have this little key that opens literally nothing. You're welcome. Number seven, graveyards. If you're like me, then you've seen enough zombie movies to know that hanging around a graveyard is the last place you want to be. It's their spawn point, duh. And every time you drive by a graveyard, you think to yourself, 
some zombie related thoughts, but dare not tell anyone for fear of sounding like a weird guy for talking about zombies rising out of the graves because it's sunny out and that's that just sounds like a tale from the crypt episode. Well, medieval people didn't have fears of George A. Romero's movies or that weird corpse guy in Tales of the Crypt Keeper, as people like to hang out in the graveyards. Weird, I know. In medieval times, they were just a part of the town. There weren't really a lot of fences or like barriers. Sometimes there would be plays, small festivals, and even shops set up in graveyards since graveyard shops pay no tax. I guess you could say shop till you drop it. <laughs> All bad impressions aside, I'll stay away, especially with the diseases going around back then. Number six, cat burning. Excuse me, yeah, boy. Medieval people just hated cats. A lot of the ye old people thought cats were symbols or allies of the big red with the horns. And yeah, they aren't the most pleasant of animals, but I love my cat. Yeah. Not that one. Unfortunately, in the Middle Age France, it was custom to burn a barrel full of live cats over a burning fire every Midsummer's Eve, as people shrieked with laughter and danced around with glee. French kings often witnessed it and even ceremoniously started the fire. But they did much more than that too, like King Charles IX who threw a live fox onto the fire for added variety. Or in 1648, Francis King Louis XIV, then aged just 10, lit the tinder on a large bonfire in central Paris, then watched and danced with glee as a basket of stray cats was lowered into the flames. A man who wrote to his brother about the celebration of coronation of Queen Elizabeth I wrote, Last Saturday, the coronation of Queen Elizabeth was solemnized in the city with mighty bonfires and the burning of a most costly pope, carried by four persons in diverse clothing, his belly filled full of live cats, who squalled most hideously as soon as they felt the fire. What the hell? Number five, castles. Besides a knight in shining armor, what's the first thing you think of when you think of medieval times? Castles, yeah, obviously. Yes, I'm talking about castles, but bear with me here, just hear me out. Okay, so when we were kids, we all wanted to live in a huge mansion, right? I mean, who doesn't? I wouldn't though, because, well, it would be a pain in the neck to clean. As you grow up, you start thinking about weird things like that. It'd be really difficult to clean. But it's a common wish nonetheless. Well, castles basically are medieval mansions, except with a little twist. These. Castles are also designed with military strategy in mind. So imagine, if you will, you have a world where your parents have a mansion, uh, but they had to add guard towers and an armory and a battalion of soldiers just in case the next kingdom over gets a, a little too frisky. The positioning of the castle was also very important too. Some built by the coast on top of hills and even some inside of mountains all in the name of protection. To me, that's like some purge level reality where wealthy homes have to be built with defenses in mind. It's kind of messed up. Number four, fair. Punishments for crime in the Middle Ages were different from they are today. Capital punishment happens now still, like it did then, but we don't really put people into exile so much anymore. Unless you count the prison system, but th that's another conversation altogether. Back in medieval Ireland though, someone who de-lifed someone else and was judged to be guilty was given to the deceased's family as their unwilling servant. That is, if they failed to pay the oodles of money required to buy their freedom. As we know, people who were forced into manual labor were not treated too nicely. And they were pretty much had no rights at all, being seen as property more than an individual. This means that the family that now owns said person could do whatever they wanted with them. Their life was basically forfeit. Now, if the person who ended the life of one of your beloved family members was now given to you to do whatever you wanted with them, what would you do? Yes, yes, me too, mm -hmm. probably. It seems fair to me. Leave the punishment to those who are most affected by the crime. Number three, Shark Week. Aunt Flo, she shows up sometimes during those delightful few days that ladies have. I hear you, I know. I'm not a lady, I don't know why I said that. I'm just trying to relate to the audience. But have you ever wondered how things were dealt with before the modern world of feminine hygiene products? Today, you got options, but back then, well, they didn't really exist. Ladies had to come up with methods, and honestly, the beginnings of what the products would eventually evolve into. A lot of times, it was extra cloth or rags were used, perhaps where the expression on the rag may have come from. Mm -hmm. Now, I have no issue talking about this because it's natural, it's a part of life. I'm a grown up, dude. The tradition of this point is in the tradition of hiding it or being ashamed. That's what started in medieval times, too, unfortunately. And sadly, it's carried over to today just a little bit. Some even consider cramps to be a punishment for Eve's original sin back. Back then, which is just so stupid. Things have gotten a little better, but I, I think you can all agree with me, ladies. It's time for everyone else to grow up a little bit. A number two, trick or treat, it's Christmas. What? <laughs> 
sorry. In Northern Europe and Scandinavian countries, Yule time meant adopting the tradition we are familiar with from modern Halloween. Dressing up like your favorite spooky characters, or what it is now, trying to one up your friends with the hottest insert occupation here costume you can. They didn't dress up as sexy cats or nurses though. But from the day of Christmas to the twelfth night, young men would dress up according to quote unquote the old fashion of the devil and go around in the night scaring people in the streets. These young spunky lads would go about as ghosts, trolls, or other strange creatures. And in the 16th and 17th century, some men would even dress as the Yule Goat, terrifying children and coming into people's houses demanding cake or cheese, then pleasantly thanking them if he received something, or whacking them with a stick if he didn't. Then the goat would just hop on out of there like this. That was too good. Thanks, man. Number one, Lord's Right. This one is just so messed up. Okay, so back in the medieval times, imagine if you will that you've just been married to a beautiful woman. Just finished walking down the aisle when the local lord of the land makes a surprise appearance at your wedding. At first you bow and welcome his lordship. That's when he grabs your blushing bride to be and looks at you with the snobbiest look a royal could and says, sorry bud, lord's right, gotta take her for a test drive to make sure everything's great. Yes, that's right, there was a law, or a code, if you will, that allowed lords to entertain wives for a few hours. More like a few seconds. You must also imagine this is a time when speaking out against lords for doing so would not have bode well for you or your wife, so best just go along with the plan. Number 10. Saving your pee pee. Back in the day, whole families, monasteries, and public meeting places would collect the pee pee deposited in chamber pots throughout the day. Yummy. They would take the amassed forbidden lemonade and either donate it, or if they were feeling enterprising, they could sell the wee wee to the town tanner or fuller. You see, the warm yellow liquid was used for the process of dyeing textiles and in the tanning of hides. Oh, and it was also used for cleaning clothes. Screw the smell of Tide and bounce dryer sheets, I'll take the smell of wetting the bed and grandpa's favorite chair, thank you very much. Urine was also used by physicians at the time to tell the health of their patients. I do this too. You know when it's clear and you feel like you're the most hydrated guy around? It's nice. I definitely don't taste it like the physicians back then though, or Saul Goodman in season 5 of Better Call Saul. I'll stick with apple juice for my favorite yellowish drink, thanks. Number 9, Belladonna, or commonly known as Deadly Nightshade. Now what would our medieval ancestors be doing with such a lethal ingredient? Well truth be told it had a few uses. One of the more strange was for beauty. Belladonna had this strange effect on the pupils. The consumption of belladonna through eye drops or a liquid would result in dilated pupils which for a long time in Europe was considered to be very beautiful. At least it was considered beautiful, I don't know if that really is. The trouble, well it's poison. It's like if you were complimenting me on my summer ready body, except I told you my secret was drinking Drano. Mm. To my surprise, however, this is an ingredient you can find today in certain medicines, combined with other ingredients. In small doses, it makes it not harmful. I thought it would be fun to talk about all the side effects as fast as I can. Dry mouth, dry skin, inability to sweat, muscle spasms, blurred vision, enlarged pupils, hallucinations, inability to urinate, talk to Adam, convulsions, seizures, coma, acid reflux, fever, rapid heartbeat, gastrointestinal infection, high blood pressure, constipation, and more urination problems. Adam's the guy you need to talk to for that. Number eight. Barber for a brain transplant. No, not actually. I don't think they even knew what a brain transplant was, let alone how to perform one. But in the Middle Ages, barbers were not just responsible for cutting your hair and giving monks that lovely bald thing going on top. No, they were also responsible for tending to the wounded after doing battle, taking care of the sick, and all the other medical services that the actual physicians were too good for. It's actually the reason we see those red and white spinning signs outside barbers because it's symbolic of the bloody rags they would use to show that they could do the bloodletting required of monks in the Middle Ages. These barbers even formed a guild in the 13th century, lasting all the way up to the 18th century. Barbers are talented individuals. No one can cut my hair the way Tony does. Number 7, Jesters. If you were to peer your nightshade eyes into a royal court, it might take a second because that's something good for you, you'll find a few things. First and foremost, you will see a king and his throne, the man who rules it all. Next to him would be a most beautiful queen, the woman who has it all. Hiding in the room upstairs are his mistresses, that's just how it goes. Loyal knights, advisors, cooks, everyone's here. 
as Mr. Sakurai would say, except for one missing person. Who? Me and, and Adam, the Jesters. Oh, uh, hi. Sorry. The Jesters, the Jokers. Yes, no royal court is the same without the Jester. The Jester's job was to jest, laugh. He's a ye olde comedian. Now, it might seem like it sucks, especially because, well, they wore strange attire and that hat was supposed to resemble that of an ass's ear or a donkey's ear, depending on what you want to say. But the Jester possesses a unique power. No, not the power to fart on command. That's my power. The power to speak freely, or at least more freely than most. This was a time when speaking out against the king could lose your head. The Jester could speak about the kings this way because, well, everything he said was taken as a joke. Some advice I think we could all take today. Number six. Everybody drinking. I recently went to go pick up some beers, and I went up to the cashier and I got my debit card out and prepped my ID. The cashier asked me, how do you want to pay? And I handed him my ID, being so accustomed to being confused for a prepubescent younger lad. He looked at me confused and said, nah, you're good bro, and boom, embarrassment. This interaction would never take place back in the medieval times because literally everyone was able to drink. It was usually the case to drink beer or wine and it was usually the case to drink beer or wine in place of clean water. Now they did have clean water before you all jump on me in the comments, but for when it wasn't on hand, beer and wine was accepted in its place. It was a common part of the medieval diet. I think they convinced themselves of this in the same way I tell myself it's okay to have another one. Well, it's made of grains with water, so that means it's healthy, right? Red wine is good for my heart, so drinking it right out of the bottle is okay, right? No, probably not. Number five, helmeted chicken. Why the clock back 10 years ago? I was but a humble freshman in high school. I was green behind the ears. I didn't know what to expect. Sure, people had prepped me for the worst, but I just didn't know what to expect. I got even more nervous when I saw the pretty girls showing up. Gosh, they were so pretty. <sighs> Someone be my girlfriend? But I relaxed. I knew I was okay because at lunchtime, I was gonna watch my favorite YouTube channel, Epic Meal Time. Besides this one, it's a good channel, you should check it out. We're awesome. They made combinations of food that I didn't even think were possible. I was absorbed into their culture, and who wasn't? Why do I bring the awkward time of 2012 back up? Well, that's because the Medieval Times had their own version of a turducken. Sort of. While it's not a chicken inside a duck inside a turkey inside a pig covered in bacon like EMT did, it's similar and perhaps off-putting for our veggie fans. Basically, there was a chicken sewn to a pig to look like a knight riding on a horse. And yes, I'm sure the chef washed his hands. Right? Number four, going to the schedule de -lifing. Entertainment wasn't as accessible or the same as it is now. In modern times, we pull up our phones, turn on our laptops, sit in front of the TV, and there is all the entertainment we need, from battles to baby drama. But back in the Middle Ages, there wasn't much to do after you were done your work for the day. There were forms of entertainment, music, theater, games, sports, etc. But a favorite would have to be going to see the latest ne'er-do-well lose their head. Public shows of punishment were not just something you went to see when you were bored. Actually, their more important purpose was as a deterrent for anyone who thought of maybe committing a crime. And yeah, that would do the trick. It was also a good way to finalize the trial of a criminal for all those who were affected or who were part of the village. Eventually, they became more of a private affair, but not entirely with the last public de-lifing in the United States happening in 1936. Let's not bring this one back. No, I'm good. I'll pass. Number three, witch trials. Speaking of scheduled de-lifing, witch trials, or rather, uh, get rid of anyone who's been deemed a witch, which in case you didn't know was uh, as simple as this. Right then, the young woman down the lane is smarting at her boys in the school. Right then folks, pitchforks and torches it is. Unfortunately, for a lot of women at the time, it was tough. When has it not been, right ladies? While some men were declared witches too, this was a tool really for people with power to get rid of those who dare oppose them. There's too many royals to mention who took part in this, however, one stands out as Bloody Queen Mary. Names like this were not given for no reason. She was known for sending witches and heretics alike to the stake to be cooked. Number two, outlaw. In movies and TV, characters named as outlaws, specifically in the Wild West sense, are seen as cool guys, outsiders, and wanderers with an air of mystery and possibly power. Trust me when I say it was not what you wanted to be, especially in the medieval times. If you were declared an outlaw in the Middle Ages, you lost all rights, possessions, and any kind of protection being part of society would give you, including people getting in trouble for ending your stay on this plane of existence. 
You are forced to fend for yourself with nothing to your name. And in a world rife with disease, wars, bandits, and very little readily available food or water, things get harsh quick. If you didn't have a buddy to turn to for help, who you knew for a fact would not literally stab you in the back, then you were pretty screwed. Luckily, I have Andrew. Right? Yeah! Number one, ladies. Okay, so let's say you're married. Husband tends the crops. You as the wife take care of the home. This isn't a statement about the patriarchy. I'm just saying taking care of the home is just as important back then. Seriously, it is. Well, your husband comes in from tending the fields one night with a fever. Uh-oh, he's fallen ill, and now he's perished. Now you're left alone with no income and a society that's probably not okay with you working. So that means it's time to pull up your pants. Well, actually, pull them down, as in a scenario like this, it would be time to work that street corner, and a lot of women did do that. The same way Adam works on building Legos in his dungeon. I joke. But as they say, it's the oldest profession in the book, and folks, it's not going anywhere anytime soon. Tradition or not. Starting off this list, in our number 10 spot, we have the leech collector. This job truly is exactly what it sounds like. It's a person who is responsible for the collection of leeches. The little blood suckers were a popular treatment back in medieval times when just bleeding was a common treatment for a variety of ailments. Headache? Just bleed a bit. Common cold? Have I got a solution for you? Bloodletting, especially by way of leech, was actually used medicinally for thousands of years with possible ties to ancient Egypt. This medical treatment, however, of course, required leeches, which meant that someone needed to collect them. Many leech collectors were people who didn't have a lot of money, and more commonly, women. The job required waiting in the water and searching for leeches, and how do you catch them? With your legs, of course. Leech collectors would wait for leeches to latch onto them, and normally would have to wait for about 20 minutes before pulling them off because they were easier to remove after getting fat with blood. How horrible. This already sounds awful, but what's worse is that after being bitten by a leech, the wounds tend to bleed more than a normal cut even would. This was great to get more leeches interested, but bad as a human who was trying to keep blood inside of their body. This job usually led to those who did it to contract illnesses from the leeches, their open wounds, or just have severe blood loss because at the time, people didn't know you could overdo it with bloodletting this way. In our number 9 spot today, we have the fuller. Wool is a clothing staple. It's been used for centuries, but back in medieval times, there was a disgusting part of the job that thankfully doesn't exist anymore, thanks to the invention of modern chemistry. Wool is naturally waterproof due to the fact that it contains oils that have been distributed from the sheep's skin. And these oils are what made the entire harvesting, carding, spinning, and weaving processes possible in these times. This is all fine and well, but the trouble comes in after all of that, because the cloth at the end of it all was coarse and easily frayed. And this is where the job of a fuller came in. They were tasked with removing the oil from the cloth. Okay, a little alkaline solution, no problem, right? Well, yeah. Except for in these times, the most accessible and cheap alkaline solution was stale urine. Yep, just a bunch of old pee. A fuller had to take this new woven material, put it into a tub full of old pee from who knows where, and then you stomp on it with your feet. And then you get no shower at the end of it either. What's a carpenter without his tool belt, right? What I mean is that fullers were also responsible for collecting their own pee to use for the wool. So they often needed to head to all the local public toilets and private homes to collect it. Just gets worse. In our number 8 spot today, we have the Groom of the Stool. This job doesn't sound too bad with just the title, it weirdly sounds kind of regal. I mean, it was quite a prestigious position during this time, but it also was one of the most humiliating jobs in history. In the medieval times, kings were looked on almost as if they were gods, you know, it's their divine right. And because of this divine right, for centuries, it was deemed improper for a king to wipe his own behind after using the facilities. This is where the Groom of the Stool comes in, this high level noble men would be responsible for fetching the toilet chair for the king when nature called, and he would also be in charge of the wiping aspect of the whole thing. No bidets, I guess, back then. The groom of the stool also played a role in monitoring the king's health, as he was tasked with examining the stool just to watch for any serious changes. And should the king be having some digestive troubles at any point, the groom of the stool would always be nearby and ready to administer a royal enema. In our number 7 spot today, we have the nightman. This is definitely one of the Shit. 
guess jobs from the medieval times and I mean that quite literally. Also referred to as gong farmers, these people had the unfortunate job of cleaning out all of the human waste from the cesspits in the castle walls which they would then transport to a pre-arranged location where it would be buried. These cesspits were the medieval equivalent to a septic tank and they were usually located on the lowest level of the castle. The nightmen would end up digging through weeks, months, just sometimes even years of disgustingness and they were motivated to gather as much as possible considering the fact that they were paid by the ton. Imagine, that's a frightening amount of work. The job was also quite hazardous too. I mean if we really think about what exactly they are doing, it quickly becomes clear that many of them died from disease and there was also a good chunk of people who suffocated on the job as well. In our number 6 spot today we have a sin eater. Okay, This is definitely one of the strangest jobs on this list. The job of a sin eater was to, well, eat sins. To do this they were tasked with eating a piece of bread that had been placed on the chest of someone who had died. Definitely not an ideal day of work for me personally. The idea behind this was that in consuming the bread they were consuming the sins of that person so that they could carry on into the afterlife peacefully. Basically sin eaters were willing to sacrifice their own souls and their own eternal happiness just to make some money while they were alive. I'm not sure what's worse, taking the risk with the sins or eating bread from off of a dead person. No, no, both bad. In our number 5 spot today we have the executioner. We have all heard of this job before. After all, an important aspect of the medieval times was the fact that they were trying to have better criminal law enforcement, which naturally meant that a ton of people were getting executed for their crimes. While there is of course now the stereotype of people who did this work as being these huge hooded evil people, history shows that this stereotype is largely untrue. Most of the people who fell into this job didn't come into it because they wanted to. In fact, most people of course saw this job as being undesirable, but the job usually was bestowed upon them. Sometimes butchers were called for the job because of relevant experience, other times it was criminals who could either do the job or face their own death sentence, and most commonly people found themselves in the job because their fathers had been executioners before them. Aside from the nitty gritty of the job, I mean the horrors of the work itself, it's obvious, another part of being an executioner that sucked was the fact that people didn't really want to associate with you. Execution Executioners were usually on the fringes of society and outcast, sometimes even forced to actually live on the edge of town. In our number 4 spot today we have cat gut. Back in the medieval times they didn't have the technology we have now, or even the technology that was available in the 17th century when it came to making strings for instruments such as the violin, but they still did have violins around, so how? Well, in comes the invention of cat gut, which thankfully is not made of cat guts, but it is made of sheep's guts. Okay. Really had you in the first half there. Violin string makers during this time would make the strings by basically twisting strands of sheep innards together. Their job would require them to butcher the animal in a very careful way, making sure not to rupture the stomach or the lower intestines. The process could take hours just to get the required materials from the animal. The insides then needed to be soaked in a wood ash solution for a good cleaning, but they needed to be monitored at all times to ensure that they weren't beginning to spoil, which is horrible. From here, the drying process began and after that it was time for twisting. In our number 3 spot today we have the rat catcher. Another job that really is just what it sounds like. Rat catchers had quite a busy time during the medieval times. There was a rat problem and these rats were filthy and full of disease and someone needed to catch them. Castles were often filled with extra grain, vegetables and herbs in the case of emergency and this led to the perfect environment for rats and mice. Even before the connections were drawn between rats and disease people hated them and this is because they would eat your food. A bad rat infestation for a person without much actually could have been a death sentence for them during this time. This meant that people really appreciated rat catchers in society, although the job wasn't a great one, was clearly risky, and also was largely ineffective. Rat catchers would sometimes try and use spells, sometimes they would use herbs as a sort of poison, and sometimes they'd even use the good old leave the body as a warning to the other rats trick. Yeah, wonder why it didn't work. In our number 2 spot today we have the treadmill operator. This is a job that sucked during the medieval times because it was boring, it's basically like a human hamster wheel, but also because it was incredibly dangerous and not for those who were afraid of heights. Treadmill operators would normally be placed at the highest point of a structure and the wheel they were stepping on was the top half of like a pulley system to help things be hoisted up as they were building said you know, structure that they're at the top of. This is a practice that started in ancient Rome and was reintroduced in the middle ages. 
Jesus. This was actually a job that was commonly given to people who were blind because the fear of heights dissuaded a lot of people from doing this job, which only makes it probably more dangerous. In our number one spot today, we have the lime burner. Lime mortar has been a common and important building material for years, stemming back to the first century BC, but despite its importance, it's not exactly easy to work with. In order to use it, you need to remove the carbon monoxide from the calcium rich stone, and this was the job of a lime burner. They needed to take the stone and heat it in a kiln at around 800 degrees Celsius. Sounds easy enough, for sure, except for the fact that the job meant that you were constantly being exposed to rooms full of carbon monoxide and dust chalk that was capable of removing your ability to breathe. And also, just to top it all off, there's also a high risk that once the stone was done heating, it might also explode if it comes into contact with water. So. Better hope none of your sweat drips down onto it or else things are not good. Number 10, Hedgehog. I bet all the things you thought people ate back then, you weren't expecting Hedgehog. I know I wasn't. This is medieval times, however, and sometimes food ran short. Sometimes you gotta do things you wouldn't normally do, and that includes eating a poor hedgehog. It starts by ending the life of a porcupine or hedgehog via the neck. Ooh, gross. Singeing all of those protective spine needles gutting the poor little guy where it was then boiled so it would naturally unravel because you know they're always rolled up. Uh, alternatively, you could bake them in clay for that Hannibal experience. Sonic be nimble, Sonic be quick, but that quick enough to avoid our appetites. It's kind of sick. I don't know, I couldn't think of a rhyme there. It's just gross. People eating hedgehogs, man, come on. Number nine, kitty. Honestly, I was a little surprised by this one. No, not because it is a cat. Obviously, in Western society like ours, kitties are pets, and they're just decent animals. I can accept that other cultures, and in the past, Folks were different. It's what they do. There's nothing wrong with that. However, cats kind of have an interesting history. A lot of times, they're associated with bad luck or misfortune. And not just black cats, but cats in general. Medieval times were weird. So I'm surprised that they would even try and eat one. According to one medieval recipe, it involves removing the head because that's not for eating. Obviously, should have known that. It was thought that the cat brains could make you lose your judgment. I'd argue at that point we'd already lost our judgment, but okay. The next step is simple. You bury it in the ground for a night because that's what you do, and then you boil it in a broth with garlic. Uh, I love garlic and broth just as much as the next guy, I just, I don't know if that's the recipe I'd be going for. Oh man, I'm getting sick already. Number eight, beavers. Nice beaver. Thanks, I just had it stuffed. Huh, naked gun anybody, huh, no? I love Leslie Nielsen movies, what can I say? One day folks, I promise I'll be there. Speaking of Canadian icons, Beavers! It's my national animal, and if you end up on fairgrounds, you can almost bet you will find a vendor selling fried beaver tails. The northern states will know what I'm talking about, but for the southern and western states, who for sure eat this, but have a different name for it, it's, it's fried dough, it's not actually an actual beaver tail. Beaver tails are delicious, especially with a Nutella spread. Oh, that's my favorite. The hot Nutella, it's beautiful. However, in medieval times, beavers were quite popular. It makes more sense than you think. They were already valuable for their furs, and apparently, well, they were sought after for the round boys. You know what I'm talking about? <coughs> Off here. The trend of gotta do what you gotta do is gonna come up a lot on this list. That's just kind of how things go. There's an animal, you're gonna eat it. Just, that's it. Number seven, roasted swan. This one is supposed to be a delicacy. Roasted swan. You just go to the park and see those swans floating in the pond and you think to yourself, yeah, I'd like to roast and eat those birds. Kind of a weird thing to think, but okay, sure. I know swans can be aggressive, but damn, okay. Anyway, more disturbing than daydreaming about eating unusual poultry is what medieval people did to prepare swans. One recipe calls for its guts and vinegar to be used in bread making. I think we'll skip on that one. And another one where the skin is removed, roasted, and then the skin and feathers put back on the bird, so you put it back on the dinner table for like a show and then peel it back off. It's just, it's strange. I feel like that's not very sanitary. I feel like the feathers are the dirtiest part. You, you always have to remove the feathers, don't you, Chris? I don't know, it's weird. Number six, sheep's business. When you've trimmed all the meat and you're staring at an animal's piece of deal, there's only one thing left to do. Wash it, clean it, stuff it with 10 eggs, milk, fat, and roast it with ginger and cinnamon. Sounds yummy, honestly. I just wish it was a better, you know, cut of meat and not the sheep's meat. Like I said, it's a case of you gotta do what you gotta do. I know today there are some dishes involving the undercarriage of bulls, and I hear it's good, but uh, you can't blame me if a tad skeptical. So that one was all about a sheep's is, is gabagool, you know, his, uh, his wiener von schnitzel miner. Number five, garbage stew. Ever walk down the stairs and say, Mom, what's for dinner? And she says, 
I don't know, but pulls off whatever she's got from the fridge and the pantry and makes a great meal. Even though deep down inside, she hasn't been grocery shopping because she got into the wine, but acted as if she had everything under control when she totally didn't. Shout out to all the moms out there who do great work. You're the best. Go ahead and go, moms. Well, that's what medieval garbage stew was, minus the whole mom part. It's a little bit of everything and anything and everything that's left over. Guts, chicken feet, leftover salt, spices, if any were available, livers. You get the point. It's kind of gross, but at some point, after trial and error, you'd probably come up with something delicious. Enough garlic and broth, maybe a little bit more kitty. Throw in some sheep gabagool while you're at it. Why not? You know? Number four, helmeted chicken. Working nine to five is hard. It takes tough people, both blue and white collar folks, with grit to wake up every morning and get the job done for their families. This is true of peasantry in medieval times. It was tough, but someone had to do it. So imagine, if you would, how you would feel after grueling days of work in the fields, defending your farm from foreign invaders and maintaining a family. That's a, that's, that's a lot, of, that's a tall order. After all that, you find out that royalty have been having extravagant dinners and meals and having meat every meal, which is kind of rare for peasants. It wasn't that common. Not only are they having meat, but they're having multiple types of meat at the same dinner and on top of that, they're sowing poultry on top of pigs to make it look like it was a knight in a coat of arms riding into battle. Just like a turducken, because they're bored, and that's that's what a helmeted chicken was. Boredom. Ugh, crazy. People are starving outside, and they're like, we should sew the chicken and the pig together. Number three, humble pie. I'll cut the brass tacks on this one. I've never had venison before, but I hear it's good. I'm willing to try it. I like trying new things. Then I can say no, you know? However, the entrails of a deer and other wild animals baked into a pie? Uh, that I'm not too sure of. I, I don't know. Maybe it's because I'm thinking about a big greasy chef who's using his bare hands, which most likely haven't been washed, and he's pounding guts into the pie like a jackhammer. The sounds, the smells, and well, it just doesn't taste good in my imagination. However, this one was quite common. It was a very common dish in medieval times. I don't know why, but it was. Can you imagine eating a Entrail pie, oh, that must be awful. Number two, chicken beer. This one's great, you guys are gonna love this one. Beer, the elixir of life. It's how Homer Simpson functions, and honestly, I don't blame him. It makes sports fun, and watching reality TV shows, when you're forced to, enjoyable. Beer is no modern invention, and it's Hoppy roots can be found in ancient times. However, the Middle Ages were no different. There's lots of beer back then, thank God. However, let's take a look at uh, a different recipe, if you will. This one includes raisins, mace, nutmeg, dates, and a boiled chicken beaten like a tough cut of meat. All of these ingredients were then put into a canvas bag and left to steep until fermentation took place. Now doesn't that sound like you just wanna pop the caps of a couple of those bad boys? Boiled chicken beer? <laughs> yes please, more like no thanks. That sounds awful. Boiled chicken beer, god damn. And coming in the number one spot today, we have Lamprey. Wait till the editor pulls up a picture of these bad boys. Hideous, ugly fish with lots of little sharp teeth around a suction cup mouth, perfect for sucking blood. They're blood suckers. While you cover up your wrist, medieval people love these little devils. This was also thought of as a delicacy. King Henry I loved them so much, in fact, well, it actually might have been his undoing. He ate too many of them, apparently. Gross. Stay off the leeches, guys. If anything, stay off the leeches. They're gross. Don't, don't. Mm -mm. No. Slander is number 10. Imagine seeing some random dude in the market square holding his nose and shouting about how he was a liar. Honestly, wasn't weird under the Norman law from 1066 to 1154. If you committed the act of slander, on top of paying damages to those whose reputation you may have affected, you also had to do the holding of the nose. This law was enacted by Pouty, first king of Norman, who had spent his whole life on the throne being called William the Bastard for his parents' unmarried status. In return, he exacted this silly law that required the slanderer to stand in the center of town, as previously described, holding their nose and shouting about their lies. Public humiliation has long since been an effective means of preventing crime. And just about anything. Number 9 is Jenny Cragging It. Edward III of England was so tired of his royal court nobility being heavier set that he made an entire law about it. In 1336, the new law 
law stated obesity made people not able to aid themselves nor their liege lord in times of need. Edward mandated a maximum belt size and also, if you watched part one, implemented food restrictions, banning more than two courses with the exception of holy days. Edward even defined soup as a separate course to prevent people from calling that a sauce or a condiment. This law lasted remarkably until 1856. Its main purpose in the long run had likely become beneficial economically to ensure that England's resources could be employed more effectively in the upcoming war with the French. Still, regardless, he seems like a fat shaming dude. German purity law is number 8. Beer is Germany's national drink and that's nothing new. The Germans have been indulging for thousands of years. Typically, beer was produced in groups and always made of pure grain. Until the purity laws made by Wilhelm IV in 1516 Bavaria. Germans and most people of the medieval and middle ages didn't drink water as it was often deeply contaminated. They drank beer. The law imposed was aimed at preventing crops used to make bread from being squandered on brewing. So it stipulates that only water, barley, and hops were allowed to be used as key ingredients for beer production. At first, brewers thought this was ludicrous and unusual to decide, but it turns out Wilhelm was actually onto something with this combination. This original law went on to become the core of German beer purity laws that affect German brewing to this day, which makes them the oldest regulations related to food and drink in the world. The only change to it in recent history was the adding of yeast. The Brewers Association of Germany wants the five century old law governing how German beer is made to become part of the UNESCO World Heritage List. It would join the Argentinian tango, Iranian carpet weaving, and French gastronomy, among other famous traditions that are considered unique and worth protecting. Let's talk sumptuary laws with the Spanish garment laws, number seven in the countdown. Sumptuary laws, which we discussed in part one, are placed in to control the nobility and their consumption and displays of material goods. In the case of Spain, there are many sumptuary laws in place as early as the Spartan era. In the 13th century, for example, Siena passed a provision reducing the trains on women's dresses, which was a direct effort to curb a purely aristocratic style. In 1356, the city of Florence proclaimed it illegal for women to have buttons on their clothing without a corresponding buttonhole. And also, no one other than the king was illegally permitted to wear a scarlet rain cape. Also in Florence, it was studied how sumptuary legislation around fashion served as a tool to encourage marriage in a society where excessive extravagance of men providing clothing for the women and their families exasperated the custom of very expensive dowries. If her standards were already up, you had to work harder to pay for her, I guess. And a delay in marriage did mean a dip in population. While there are ample examples of the laws themselves, similar to many other sumptuary laws, there's virtually no record of their enforcements or punishments. Oftentimes, this is because nobility themselves violated their own laws that they made for themselves. Without evidence of how exactly these laws were enforced or whether they were enforced at all, it remains extremely difficult to discuss their social impact, the attitude civilians had towards them as well. Did they act accordingly so as not to face legal difficulties or the payment of fines? Who knows? Not us. So on to the next. Refusing knighthood comes in at number six. This law was put into place in 1233. Why you may ask? Because simply put, being a knight sucked. If you saw our last video, you may remember hearing about how insanely taxed knights were, but on top of that, you had to pay for a ton of mandatory clothes, train incessantly, pay the king for serving him, and don't forget the custom sized armor. You lose or gain weight, you're gonna have to pay to replace whole pieces. That's on top of the potential of dying in a battle you just don't care for. No, not many people wanted to be a knight. Roger of Dudley refused to attend his own knighting when he learned he'd have to pay for it. In response to his refusal, Henry III on the spot passed a law against refusing the knighthood. He forcefully knighted Dudley and also confiscated his land to boot. Yikes. Number five is the legal protection of claiming sanctuary. Disney's Hunchback of Notre Dame depicts an iconic scene of Quasimodo swinging around on rope dramatically over the burning base of the Notre. Having just saved Esmeralda from an execution, he holds her aloft in the cathedral's terrace and screams out sanctuary. Sanctuary actually predates Christianity and originates far back into the 300s and existed until the 16th century. Every medieval law folded to the protections of sanctuary no matter the criminal's crime. Now, sanctuary seeking criminals might have been required to perform penance or go into 
exile, but they were at least guaranteed immunity from punishment. That's right, you could literally strangle someone and then run to the church to claim sanctuary and no one could come in and harm, arrest, or remove you for punishment. Sanctuary was abolished due to the new tide of judicial law and the arguments of crime, power, and punishment. Also because people should be punished for, I don't know, maybe taking someone else's life. Originally, before Christianity, it was temples such as the ones in Greek and Rome offering the solace, and it was part of the Roman law by the end of the 4th century to have it. Christianity adopted this practice to try and persuade people to join their religion when it started. Even after the Western Roman Empire fell in 476, churches maintained their authority to protect people who had broken major secular laws. Number 4, let's meet the Yellow Ladies. Venice, Italy was an important trading post. Many people came and went, many travelers came to see the great city. But for those who had been at sea for a while, they may have wanted to see a little something else. As a result, medieval Venice was a massive red light district, enjoyed by many before their next voyages. Trying to control the number of ladies working the streets, the Venetian government mandated in 1360 that brothels must be concentrated in the market and port districts. Obviously that just made their industry boom more since it was concentrated right where all the money came in and not dispersed, requiring men to travel farther out in convenient ways. Angry now that they weren't at least getting to capitalize off the potential tax revenue of these women, they in 1420 decided to be accommodative of their lady of the night friends. The Venetian government accommodated more red light districts and implemented safety means within them, as well as the law of yellow. All women of the trade were to wear shades of yellow so as to be identifiable to their clientele, so random ladies just out on a stroll who happen to be in the area don't get harassed. But also it's a little bit of that classic shame tactic of making someone unwanted easily identifiable for discrimination. Number 3 is the indigenous sumptuaries of Spain. As early as 1501, the crown warned natives who carried sword, dagger, or any other weapons that they face confiscation and may be condemned to more punishments according to what the court sees fit. Spanish restrictions against natives developed through the 16th century. This mandate is no surprise as these items, while dangerous, complemented and enhanced men's fashions, and fashionable repairs became integral to everyday masculine attire in Europe. To the indigenous, they had been items of necessity to carry and often seen as symbolic. For indigenous men of the elite, the right to bear arms highlighted much more than their privileged status the way that it did for the colonizer. It demonstrated colonial acknowledgement of their once dominant standing on their original lands and partially vindicated their marginalized reality even as a royal. June 8, 1685, Don Diego Garcia, an indigenous leader of what's now Guerrero, had petitioned to the Viceroy of New Spain to intervene on his behalf when this sumptuary denied him the right his parents, grandparents, and ancestors had always possessed. Garcia was one of 505 petitions submitted by 277 towns between 1575 and 1693 demanding change. In response to a perceived disregard for the law, the monarchy reissued the restriction six more times over the course of the next 70 years. The items requested by Don Diego Garcia reflected both indigenous and European definitions of masculinity. By focusing on European attire and the personal weapons, Garcia took advantage of the social currency imposed by Spanish colonizers. As an elite, Garcia faced decreased political power and increased marginalization under a new regime. Garments and swords provided the ability to visually assert himself in everyday life. Ultimately, petitions submitted by Garcia and his peers reflected not just a request for special status items, but an attempt to assert their belonging as an elite man in a colonial life. Number two is just absurd, but you can club a Swede. If they cross the frozen sea between Denmark and Sweden. What? This unusual law was imposed during the Dano-Swedish Wars of 1657 to 58. King Charles Gustav of Sweden had been planning to cross the Orsund by ship, but the freezing temperatures of January changed that plan. Frozen solid, the Swedes realized that they could simply just walk across. This completely caught the Danes off guard as no attack had been predicted until the spring and they scrambled to compensate. Ultimately, the Danes signed the Treaty of Roxgild and yielded to the territory dispute. But ever since that day, should you see a Swede crossing over the frozen sea on foot, you are legally free to swing a big old club at him. And finally, at number one, you either tuck it or you lose it. Medieval Wales was not playing around when it came to women being violated. If you were caught or perpetrator of this heinous crime, your options were to pay a dowry or get the little man chopped off. 
That's right, a violation such as this was actually considered a theft and was treated as such by the law. Should a perp pay the dowry, then legally the woman's virginity or body was restored in legal parameters. Can't or won't pay the fine? Well then, that was the end of down there for you. The reason for this, other than it being morally right, is that the fines and punishments hope to stop families from developing harmful feuds which would damage the wider society as a whole. This was not exclusive to Wales however, this punishment shows up in the 1750s code of Constinian Marvodokot in Eastern Europe. It was not unheard of for women to also simply just take the law into their hands either. In a rural area of Shropshire near the Welsh border in 1405, Isabella Grawernus and her two daughters ambushed her attacker in a field, tied him up and did the dreaded snip snip and stole his horses to boot. All three women were subsequently pardoned. Eating with the rich starts off the countdown at number 10. Medieval recipes depict a large variety of animals being served. Adding to the ones I listed previously are horses, lampreys, cranes, and crows, hell, even beavers. And let's not forget the animals created by their chefs. One homemade animal was called a cockentrice, and it was actually multiple animals' bodies put together before being roasted. A helmeted cock was another chef creation. It was a roasted chicken wearing a tiny helmet that was sat on the back of a roasted pig, because... Why not? Dinner in a show is always fun, so in late medieval Europe, it became fashionable to have an etrometta, which was an entertainment dish. One such example is bakers cooked a pie shell in advance, and then after it cooled, they placed live birds inside the pie and resealed it. When cut at the table, the birds would then all fly out of the pie, much to the amazement of the many banquet guests, assuming that all went accordingly. FIFA fans may want to skip out on this next one, because number nine in our countdown is making football illegal. That's right, while I may be referring to it as primarily soccer in this video, what was still called football at the time was made illegal in the medieval ages. Now there are quite a few reasons for this. Most popularly known is that the sport was extremely different then. It was violent and aggressive, resembling more of a mass brawl with minimal rules. However, it was also because only two years after soccer was banned in 1363, King Edward III would implement a mandatory archery education law. This would ensure his villagers could be used as soldiers should need be. King Edward believed that soccer, but also sports in general such as handball, football, hockey, and cockfighting were distractions and at that time they could be doing better things. I'm sure there are many of you that would disagree. Next on the countdown is number 8, the future predicting friar. There's a lot to unpack here so I'll just jump right in. English Francican monk Roger Bacon is known through history for his shockingly accurate predictions of the future transportation and life that we have now. Bacon lived from 1214 until 1292 and was the successful creator of the magnifying glass, but he also famously predicted future machinery in his book Espetola de Secretis Opribus, if I got that right. Cars can be made so that without animals, people will move unbelievably rapid, and flying machines can be constructed so that a man sits in the midst of a machine, revolving some engines by which artificial wings are made to beat in the air like a flying bird. It's a little nonsensical, but you you can see what he's implying. His other predictions included steamships, submarines, diving suits, and telescopes. That's pretty spot on for a guy who lived thousands of years ago. This is the same man who was also said to have sculpted a prophetic head of brass. Apparently having been warned by a spirit that he must listen to whenever the head first spoke, Bacon set his assistant Miles to watch over the sculpture, which he did even past Bacon's demise. It's said that after the friar's death, however, that was the first time it spoke. First saying, Time is. Then, time passed. Ignored both times by a confused mile, the head spoke only once more to say time is past before it exploded into flames. And so the chance to consult the mysterious head was lost when it combust. What do you think of the legendary Bacon and his stories of mysticism? Time is past, as the sculpted head said, so let's be happy we left this weird tradition in the past. In at number 7 in the countdown, it's the medieval animal trials. Under the ruler's power, there was no exception to medieval law, and so it should come as no surprise that even animals could face the brunt of their alleged crimes. This was no casual affair. The rich and the poor gathered for these trials as spectators. Some of the accused animals were even dressed in wigs and gloves fancy garments to be seen in front of the royal court as their fate was debated by the lawmakers. That should come as no surprise either, seeing as the medieval era wasn't exactly overflowing with entertainment outlets. There are records of at least 85 animal trials that had taken place during medieval slash middle ages.
ages. And while the most serious offenders were pigs by a landslide, there are records of some roosters and even one donkey facing the judge. What were these animals being charged for you may be asking? Many times it was the act of attacking or eating humans, as food and grain for animals was so sparse they'd often go hungry. There were also some accused of being heathens or thieves or behaving in lustuous ways. So make sure you have a walking buddy and always look over your shoulder because I guess you never know when an ill-attentioned cow may be creeping up on you. Number 6 in the countdown is the Saints Galaska Day Riot. February 10th of 1355, a group of students who attended Oxford University decide to go into town for a pint at the Swindlestock Tavern. Little did they or anyone else know that this would be the start of a notoriously famous riot. It started with belligerent complaints to the tavern owner about the quality of their drinks and service. As the tavern owner was progressively more berated, he and other patrons lost their temper with these students. The escalation led to a verbal sparring between the students and bar patrons. Both sides ended up arming themselves, but luckily, things were quickly interrupted when the mayor stepped in and demanded the arrest of the students who had harassed and assaulted the tavern owner, thus sparking this whole disaster. What should have been a peaceful resolution caused a chain reaction, however. Oxford students rose up in protest of their peers' arrest and swarmed to attack the mayor. News of that quickly spread, and the townsfolk revolted immediately. Many of them were already very tired of these students and their entitled complex, and had been waiting for the opportunity to rage against them. The riot that occurred ended the lives of 63 students and 30 locals. While the case's investigation led to Oxford winning against the town in court, the Oxford Council was still made to parade shamefully through the village every year on February 10th, and they did have to pay a fine to the families of each student lost. For number 5, we're getting a little spicy with risque's men's clothing. Now, you may have already heard stories or seen memes about ridiculously long pointed shoes and groin flattering armor, but did you know that provocative men's clothing was all the rage for a period of time in the medieval era? It's recorded that in the late 14th century, men were quite keen to be seen in overtly short tunics and thin tights. By 1463, a modesty statute had to be passed as men had upgraded to wearing cod pieces publicly, which did cover their mostly exposed genitals, but only by making them look cartoonishly large and bulbous in the process. A similar escapade happened with the Krakow shoe. These long, pointy-ended shoes were sometimes so long that they had to be tied back around the wearer's ankles or reinforced inside with a whalebone. The same statute in 1463 also addressed limiting these Krakow shoes for those reasons. Seems like there may be a little bit of a compensation theme here. Both provocative dressing and shoe length were limited to those of extreme wealth after the statute passed, but that didn't stop the development of some more outlandish beauty standards. For example, number four in our countdown is Plucked Bear. Nowadays, whether you're scrolling through an app or walking down the road, you're likely to see advertisements for eyelashes and hair accentuation services. And while that may be pretty trendy and normal to us, now, in the medieval ages, having hair on your face would have actually made you stand out in a crowd. Women would remove their eyebrows, eyelashes, even significantly reduce their hairline so as to achieve a smooth egg-like effect. This was because the forehead was considered the center point of the face for many years, and so it would make sense to remove anything on or around it so as to accentuate it, right? Maybe. Moving on. If you're tired of her plucking herself bald, and she's tired of you wearing shoes that enter a room before you do, then maybe it's time for a good old fashioned medieval divorce by combat. That's right, you heard me. Coming in at number 3 is divorce by combat. This finding was discovered in historic German manuscript that laid out rules as to how divorce by combat was to proceed. Their decision to use combat as a means of to solution was not unusual for medieval Germany, as trial by combat was part of their law system. Trial by combat was legally sanctioned duel that ensured whomever was to win the fight was deemed Right. There are many ways that these duels could be fought, and various weapons and locations in which to have them. The divorce by combat trial was placed when a man was put into a three foot deep hole with one hand tied behind his back. The woman, however, would have a normal ground and be able to move freely. This was believed to ensure a fair fight between the sexes. Now, there is some evidence that the outcome of these trials could still end in death, even if the death was not as a result of the combat. It's said that if the man lost to his wife, he would be taken from his hole 
hole and executed in the town square. If the woman lost, she would be then placed in the hole and then buried alive. So yeah, I'd say maybe try talking it out a little bit first before resorting to a public throwdown that can end in death. And while we're on the topic of trials, number two on the countdown is trials of the dead. Who would have such a vendetta with the dead that they would have them unburied to stand a trial? Well, new Pope Stephen, that's who. In 897, the months old body of Pope Famorpheus, the first pope to ever be executed, was extracted from his grave to serve trial for his alleged usurping of papacy. The new pope donned the corpse in elaborate robes and even assigned a deacon for defense. You may be wondering why the new Pope Stephen had done this to his predecessor. Since a holy person's body was considered to become a holy relic in death, it became a holy right to display their corpse in public tombs or churches so petitioners may still visit their former saint to leave tokens or deliver prayer. What better way to ensure that you have devoted attention of the community than a postpartum smear campaign where your opponent can't defend themselves because, well, they're dead. Stephen found the deceased Pope from Morpheus guilty so that he could toss his body into the Tiber River, as nobody can venerate his relic if his body is lost at sea. That's a pretty intense way to upsurp the person who had the job before you. Jokes on Stephen, however, as shortly after this trial, he was executed just like his predecessor, making him once again come in second to Famorpheus. Call it karma. With that dose of crazy, we can move on to medieval madness, which ranks at number one in our countdown. What was the medieval madness? Well, if you're a fan of rye bread, you may not want to listen in on this. In an era without refrigeration systems as well as poor hygiene, produce was left to natural elements. As a result, mold and bacteria growth was common and would of course migrate into food. Ergot mold is the most well known for its effect on the brain. It caused wild hallucinations and extreme emotional changes as the chemicals in your brain became imbalanced. The consumption of this mold and bacteria has had a variety of exclusively unpleasant side effects such as vomiting, diarrhea, convulsions, delayed visions, even mania and psychosis. These symptoms make it obvious as to why this could be labeled as a madness. The extreme cases of ergot consumption would of course lead to things such as loss of limb, gangrene, or death. And this connection between molding rye flour and ergot poisoning wouldn't be made until 1670. So for hundreds of years beforehand, commoners saw ergot poisoning to be things like demonic possession. Many theorize and connect the medieval madness to that of the time periods of the witch trials. The trials began in 1691 a year of intensive wet and cold which produces a higher level of ergot. They ended abruptly in 1693, a year said to be sparse on rye grain. If there's less to consume, there's less ability to be poisoned. Making it arguable that there could be a connection between the two, especially as a side effect of ergot poisoning could be mistaken as demonic possession as previously mentioned. And that is also seen as a symptom of witchcraft. Still, this may not be the kind of bread you want to chase.